Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. On a warm spring, early March Sunday afternoon my wife and our neighbor, a very desirable looking woman who had never married were sitting on the raised second level deck enjoying the warmth of the day talking. I have to be honest, I have found myself looking at our neighbor in a non-proper manner more than once and have had to hide my saluting Johnny. For my tastes, she was that appealing. If I had met her first, I would never have married my wife. But like all honorable doofuses, I had made my bed and I would lie in it. I was directly underneath them quietly working on something that now seems unimportant. Neither of the ladies knew that I was there because I had needed to get a few things done. It was the serious conversation they were having above me that caught my total attention. Dinah and Bridget, both having turned 28 in the last few months, were in a heated discussion about what they were looking forward to in life. Bridget was frustrated because none of the men she had dated were really marriage material in her eyes. She was husband hunting because her biological clock in her mind was ticking down and she wanted a couple of children towing behind her as soon as possible. It didn't help that her mother felt she should have been married to a good man years ago and was beginning to think that she was too picky. As her mother said, she should just find a man, train him, and get it done. My wife Dinah, on the other hand, had always been a strong independent woman who listened to no one said, after we got married. I told my husband Trey that the doctors said I couldn't conceive so when I was in the hospital a few years back getting my appendix removed. I had the doctors tie my tubes at the same time. Trey still does not know that I had that done. I wanted to make sure that I would never have kids because I was afraid it would alter my looks. My image is very important for my fans on social media. I cannot be seen with hanging tits and stretch marks. It took a while, but Trey is finally beginning to accept it. Bridget said, Dinah, that's the dirtiest thing I have ever heard of. Trey would make a great dad. He loves kids. You both talked about having kids. What gives you the right to deny him in that way? Why would you do that? I did it because I needed to change the perception of his reality, Dinah said, by making him believe that it was an act of God that brought my medical problem upon me. So, you used his belief in your honesty to deliberately deceive him, Bridget said, just to take away for good what he hoped and planned for. If we had children, it would take away from me what belongs to me, his undivided attention, Dinah said. In the trips we take twice a year to award ourselves, children would have robbed me of the lifestyle we had created for ourselves, so I wasn't going to allow that to ever happen. I'll be right back I'm going to refill our glasses. As my wife walked back into the house, I stood there in silence as if I was saying to myself, did I just hear that? I walked out from beneath the deck and headed towards my car. I had to get out of there. Now I wanted to be as far away from my wife as possible. If I didn't the anger, I was feeling would build into a rage that I might not be able to control. What I had just heard had made me sick to my stomach, not only because of what she said, but what it implied. I was oblivious to what was around me as I was in total shock. Bridget saw me and knew that I had just overheard their conversation. I would learn much later that Bridget was attracted to me just as much as I was to her. Out of our mutual respect for Dinah, neither one of us had acted upon it. She decided at that moment that I was the perfect man for her to procreate with because she saw me as being great father material. She decided that if I started thinking about divorcing my wife Dinah, because of her lies she would find a way to move in to be my partner in the walk of life. Dinah and Bridget grew up in different environments. Dinah's father was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and spoiled his daughter with everything. She expected the best and demanded it. Her first full-time job was in upper management in one of his businesses. So money to her was just a convenience to make things easier. She expected the best that money could buy regardless of price and was not satisfied with anything less. Dinah, a stunning woman with black curly hair and 34, 26, 34 body shape and was 5 foot 6. She was very critical if everything was not over the top all the time. Even our vacations were to the extreme. For her, it was two weeks of being pampered too as if she was the Queen of England. For me, they were a waste of money and nothing but a bore. They were something I neither wanted nor enjoyed. Every piece of clothing or jewelry was picked by Dinah to enhance her image as a trendsetter and a leader in the social media community. She had successfully turned her Instagram and Twitter account into a money-making adventure. Since she started on that course, she went into it with the determination that was extreme. Everything was planned to get her further attention via the social pages and the mass media. Everything she did these days was to enhance its revenue potential. Every month she had a new hairstyle and a new image. In fashion, she was more popular locally than the president's wife. She was being followed so much that if she decided she liked something and bought it within weeks for many it was a must-have item. Over the last three years, her following had grown to just over a million. She was working with two to three sponsors, 
and was making good money by being nothing but a social butterfly. It was her ultimate goal was to land a big sponsor in which there was the possibility to make millions. She loved being the center of attention and milked it to her advantage. Every image of her was designed to influence her marketability and to draw more followers into the illusion she was creating about herself thus adding to its revenue generating stream. On occasion, she would type something on Twitter just to be able to create a situation or an idea that would give her additional wanted attention. Being out and about in the city during social events was important to her. The more people in her entourage, the better the visibility in the gossip pages, which in turn was tweeted about and Insta Reels were shot and posted. If it was happening in the city of New York, she had to be part of it. That meant she was out most nights until the wee hours of the morning. As a result, I quite often was left behind and that suited me fine. I did not need the limelight or brainless idiots following me to define who and what I am. Besides the daytime job, I had required that I had to be sharp and on my game. If I didn't, I would last long in the cutthroat business I was in. Bridget's father was a working stiff who slowly worked his way up the ladder the hard way. He had to work hard and long for everything he got. He had passed his values on to all of his children and took nothing for granted. Starting with nothing, he designed a product, developed it into a marketing line, and over the years had grown his company into a worldwide organization by buying out businesses that would fit into what he was building. He ran a tight ship, kept his costs under control, and his organization was one of the blue chip stocks that paid increasing dividends every year. His team had a slow and steady approach that worked for him very well. In his personal life, his wife and children always came first. He raised his daughter to be grateful for what she got or what she earned. It was hard to earn but easy to lose, so one had to be careful and modest in everything they did. Bridget was selective and more reserved in her nature towards things like getting more value for half the price out of things than my wife ever did. Those values had brought her a long way since she had graduated from university. Both were quite secure in their positions in life. Yet the two were the complete opposite in every way. It still puzzled me how they could become friends. Bridget had a wholesomeness to her that bloomed fully. She would be just as happy holding a fishing pole in a river dressed in blue jeans having a blast with friends and family, than being the center of attention at a high society dance. For any man who took the time to know Bridget, they could spend the rest of their lives being content by just being with her. An added plus would be the benefits gained by being lost in those sensual curves. Even at her age, she was a natural beauty whose loving nature would be a great asset when she became a mother. Anyone who ran into her knew she was the real package, not someone creating herself to become the image everyone wanted to be. In my eyes, both of the ladies were polar opposites. I was digesting the words I had heard out of my wife of six years' mouth over a cold beer at a strange watering hole. The way I saw it, the more I felt like I was nothing but a glorified servant. I was expected to perform a role Dinah had designed for me, and as long as I did, she would be happy. Everything she did for me was to benefit what she was trying to do with her social media presence. Seeing what our relationship had evolved into forced me to ask myself what she had seen in me in the first place. The longer I thought about it, the more I understood how little love there was left in our marriage. I was now just one of the many toys she had to make her online image and lifestyle better. She had been the judge, juror, and executor in how our marriage would work. My thoughts about us and our relationship no longer mattered. To protect a lie, she had made sure that her body would not reproduce. In this reality, I was seeing that she really had an inability to appreciate anything. She used all to further her goals. I was just another tool she had to manipulate and turn into an advantage. My wishes and wants had been totally marginalized in our marriage. Now that I had learned her real truths and the lies, she used to promote them I had to decide if I could continue to live with them. My cell phone rang. I looked at it and killed the call. I wasn't really ready to talk to the queen bee I had married. I was too busy trying to figure out if I should stay or run. By the time I left the bar, I pretty much had decided what had to be done. I would no longer be at her beck and call. She would have to start doing a lot of things for herself. No longer would she have my full support. Our lives were about to change in a drastic manner. I knew that in her self-centeredness, she would never comprehend the reality of what was going to happen. I could now see clearly that Dinah for the last three years had been slowly separating herself from building a future with me. I wasn't sure if she realized it. Neither had I, but I did now. I prepared to go home knowing full well she would be gone to be seen at another social event with her entourage. I had taken stock of our life together and knew where it was now headed. I knew for sure with the direction she was going there was no way for her to come back to some point of normalcy. I walked into my office the next day bright and early before anyone else had got there. I pretty much had decided my marriage to Dinah was over. I was looking at the end of the last market day stock values and the futures market for our clients. 
Algorithms would click in automatically if they were triggered, but I was looking for stocks that I could buy short and buy back later for less, both for my clients and me personally. Five or six times a year, I would play the day trader game to make some extra revenue for my clients who allowed that. I knew that I'd best make as much as possible as fast as possible, because when I walked out on my marriage this job would likely be over. My wife's father was one of the firm's biggest clients, and he would most likely demand it. Knowing that I was really motivated, and had to be extra careful, I found two stocks that looked promising and tagged them to pop up on the screen when the markets opened. It paid off. I sold them short in the morning three times before the first hour of trading was done with large volumes which got people believing it was time to sell. The latest rumors about those trade deals added to the turmoil in the market that day. After the comment from the officials in China was heard by the market it plunged downward. I was thankful that the smallness of political leaders allowed their childish behavior to come out publicly. One idiot said something stupid, so the other had to respond in kind. The stock market dropped 500 points by noon by the end of the day, it was down 900 points. The two stocks I had picked were two of the day's biggest losers. I put in buy-in at 2 p.m. for $2 a share less than the current value and by closing, I had bought all I had sold earlier back. For my clients, I had made $1.7 million net. For myself, I netted out at $250,000. I was very proud of the day's accomplishments, but I had no one to tell. After the stock market closed, I started to draft the emails I would send out in the morning to inform the clients what I had done and how much they had made. The second paragraph would contain my suggestions on what to do with it to avoid a huge tax bill at year-end. It was almost five when I got done. I called Bridget at her father's office and asked her to join me for supper if she was still going to be in the downtown part of the city at the end of the workday. She was, and we arranged a time and a place. Then I texted my wife Dinah to inform her I was having dinner with a new client knowing damn well that she wouldn't care because she was out and about either creating or getting more social media attention. Dinah responded in kind letting me know what she was doing and that she wouldn't be home until the wee hours in the morning at the earliest. She and her entourage were hitting one of the popular nightclubs to create some Instagram moments to promote her social presence. The key to her success was keeping her physical presence out there. I was realizing that in her reality Dinah had to be the center of attention because everything was about her and her wants. Bridget was waiting for me in the lobby of the restaurant when I walked in. In her office clothing, she still looked stunning to me. I guess she caught me looking too closely at her in a way she hadn't seen before because a huge warm smile came across her face. Approaching her I informed her I had made our reservation. So she stood up and placed her arm around mine as we walked to the hostess. Once I told the hostess my name we were escorted to our table. I pulled out her chair so she could sit down before I went and did the same to mine. Once we were sighted, across from each other we started to relax. I thought she had the prettiest emerald eyes. I'm not surprised you called me Trey, Bridget said. I assume you heard your wife and I talking yesterday because when you walked to your car, I could see the look of shock on your face. Unfortunately, I did. It was an eye-opening event for me that has forever changed everything, I said. There is no way that Jeannie can be put back in the bottle because if I had known the truth in the first place, we would not have gotten married. You don't really mean that, do you? Bridget asked. Yes, I do, I replied in a serious voice. Have you decided what you're going to do? Bridget asked as we took our seats across from each other. Considering what I have learned, Dinah has really left me no choice, I said. I'm not a man who can live someone else's lies or accept them. Maybe others will, but I won't. Her conduct has made it clear that I was never worth being told the truth. It sounds like you're going to want me to verify what she said, Bridget observed. And how do you want me to do it? A notarized statement should do it, I said. With that, I can go to court and get the court to order the hospital to prove or disprove that the medical procedure was done. Since Dinah has already stated that it was, it is now legally can be researched with a court order because in the court's eyes it's now considered public knowledge. But how will that help you in the divorce? Bridget asked. I can't see it giving you an advantage. You're right in a divorce it wouldn't be. In an annulment it's a gold mine, I said. It lays the foundation of proof that fraud was used by her to get me to marry her. The court would be forced to rule that she leaves with only what she brought into the marriage. Bridget's face went white. Trey's thinking was brilliant. Dinah would be more upset by being dinged in the pocketbook than having her marriage ended. She believed by what she had been witnessing that their marriage had devolved to the point that it was nothing more than a friend with benefits thing. She now believed that Trey was beginning to see it in the same way. An annulment would make it in the court's eyes as if the marriage never existed. Her deliberate deception was the key part, and she realized it. Dinah had told him what she needed him to believe so that she could satisfy her wants and wishes. What you don't know Bridget, 
that I was with Dinah when she broke the news that she couldn't have children to her parents, I said. That was before she had her tubes tied. They were devastated because they were looking forward to being grandparents. It's her own conduct that is creating the problem. It will kill them to find out the truth, Bridget said. I have known them for years, they're good people and don't deserve this, but neither do you. I'll have the statement you need set up to be couriered to you tomorrow. I will use an in-house staff notary to do it. Thank you, I said. Now let's sit back and enjoy our wine and each other's company while we eat. It was an enjoyable meal. Bridget and I discussed our likes and dislikes in general. It surprised us both just how much we had in common. Until now we had been nothing but acquaintances, but circumstances were forcing us to open up to each other. That night we started to become friends. It had led to a pleasant discovery of how much we had in common. We ended up going home together because she lived next door. Just before we said goodnight, Bridget added one more suggestion. Trey, I'm going to be trying to get my father to turn over the management of his personal investments and mine over to you, Bridget said. I'll tell Dinah that it was my father's idea. That way I can keep you informed what's in the back of her mind without getting the second degree from her about the friendship we're developing. Sounds good. Text me your email address so I can forward some information that you can share with your father, I said. That way you will have some valid reasons why you're making the suggestion to him. I know our fee structure is less than most of our competition. The first thing the next morning, I sent her the confidential information of what we charged for regular clients and what our spread was for corporate when in negotiations for 401's accounts of their employees. By giving Bridget the tools she needed, I was protecting both her and me from being accused of doing something unethical for our own benefit. True to her word, Bridget got me the letter the very next day. I forwarded it the same day to my lawyer who would get me one of the best divorce lawyers in his firm to handle the case. For the rest of the week, Bridget and I would chat on the cell phones briefly. It became something I looked forward to each day. Friday was a day that completely blew me away. The stock market had gone up drastically all week and had gained back what it had lost on Monday. So, I sold some of the shares I had bought from Monday's profit for myself and my clients for a nice profit while leaving the original dollar value of investments intact. My clients were super happy with the results. It was at 11 a.m. on Friday when I got called to report to the president's office. Since he was a busy man to be called to his office unexpectedly meant that either you were being promoted or escorted out the door. His executive assistant looked at me and smiled saying, don't worry, go right and he's expecting you, Mr. Richards. That made me more worried because his receptionist had never called me Mr. since the first day I had started. The president stood up as soon as I entered and offered me his hand saying, well done Trey Richards. Getting the president of Data Store Control Corporation to consider coming to our firm with his employee retirement funds for us to manage is a great achievement. The size of that account alone just about doubled our overall volume of what we manage. The vice president in charge of that division is working out the final details right now. He's a tough negotiator according to David but is fair. He added, showing him how we could save the employees thousands in service fees was tactfully done by you. Well, done young man. We could use a few more like you. When are they coming over? I asked. We take over the management the 1st of April, he said. I understand you will be handling Clarence Smith's personal account as well as his daughter Bridget. Well, I can't take all the credit, sir, I said. If it wasn't for the team, I would not have been able to swing it. He smiled and said, I think there is more to this story than you're going to tell me. Very few get into Clarence Smith's circle. He is known to be a very private man. I will respect your need for privacy on this matter and leave it at that. With what you have achieved, you have gotten the whole board's attention and mine. I laughed and smiled not knowing just what to say. Just then a text message came through that saved the day. It was from Bridget Lunch at one. On me, we'll explain. A smile came across my face. Bridget Smith wants to meet me for lunch, I said as I texted back to confirm. I guess she wants to confirm what's going on and to talk about our directions going forward. Take as long as you want if you got nothing pending, the president said. You've more than earned it. You're now the man I expect to keep me directly informed if there are any problems with them going forward. That one statement made it clear just how important I had become in his eyes. I went back to my office and shut down my computer. Out of a force of habit, I wanted to protect my client list as much as possible. That way no other in the pool could easily steal them. I was looking forward to hearing Bridget explain why she didn't tell me. Bridget was waiting for me when I arrived. She had let her red hair down instead of having it done up in a bun. She had used a curling iron on it and it made her look years younger and brought her natural beauty to the front. She was wearing a white dress that was definitely not office wear. It hugged her frame tightly which only served to heighten the natural curves of her body. I like every other fool could not stop looking. Today she had deliberately dressed to get someone's attention. 
She had definitely got mine because looking at her had the fluids in my mouth running. It was working for I could see that she was getting a lot of eye attention from the men waiting to be seated for lunch. I was happy for Bridget. She deserved it. At 5 foot 8 she was a stunning beauty. Her body features would draw most men in. The problem was that in this area of the city to many are looking for an advantage and would be presenting themselves as something they weren't. That was partly why she stood out to me. By looking at her on a daily basis you just knew she wasn't trying to impress someone. She was content in being just herself. With the people in this part of the city, she was rare. The street name for this area was the Hustle City because most of it was playing an angle, developing an edge, or looking for an advantage. As I walked in, she stood up and walked towards me. Everyone could see the excitement in her eyes was for one man. Once we met, she kissed me softly on the cheek then wrapped her arm around mine. She did that to let all the men know she wasn't on the market. At the time I wondered why because she had always been Dinah's friend would she be showing an interest in me. I should have been able to figure it out, but I didn't because getting involved with another woman was the last thing on my mind. Trey, Bridget said, thank you for what you did. My dad's vice president in charge of finance looked at the figures you provided me and told my dad we would be crazy not to be going with the firm you work with. I got praised over and over again by the vice president for bringing the idea forward to him first when I could have gone directly to my dad. You're quite welcome. I was glad to do it, I said, but I didn't expect this to happen so fast. I thought it would take a lot longer. Each employee will be earning a bit more in their retirement accounts because the management fees are more than a percentage or two, lower than what they were paying before. Bridget said. The vice president sees me now as a valuable company asset and not just a daddy's girl. I want to thank you for that. That's an added plus, I said. But you could have warned me. I had to bluff through a surprising meeting with the president this morning. I got called in without notice, so I figured I might be facing my termination. She laughed. I did not know my dad called your firm last night and talked to one of the vice presidents to talk price and terms until this morning myself. He told me that he made sure to give you the credit for getting us interested in coming over. Sliding her hand into mine as it was the most natural thing in the world, we walked up to the hostess and Bridget gave her name. We were escorted back to our table. As she slid into the booth, I want to go to the other side of the table. Trey come sit beside me. There's plenty of room, Bridget said. I promise not to take advantage of you or lie to you ever. As for me trying to seduce you, although it might be an appealing idea to me in this place, it's impossible. I hesitated for a moment before sitting down beside her. Her comment brought a smile to my face. So far Bridget had been straightforward in her relationship with me. To me, that was like a breath of fresh air. It wasn't till after we had left that I realized she had made sure I was sitting on the outside. My father asked me how I got the inside information, Bridget whispered. I told him that it was a thank you from you for my help in clarifying a statement that is forcing you to start your divorce. He asked why a simple statement would cause a marriage to collapse. I told him that before I revealed that I should talk to you to get your approval because what we shared was confidential. That really perked his interest for some reason. It was he who suggested this luncheon. So that is why I got invited to lunch today, I said with a smile. If you trust him to keep it to himself, go ahead and explain. Partly, Bridget said. Dinah informed me when she called this morning, all excited, that she has to go to Paris, France in a week's time. She has an international luxury company wanting her to become their spokesperson in North America. This is the big sponsor she has been looking for, and they have come to her. She is going to be demanding that you change your schedule and go with her. Ah, uh, I see, I said. It's going to be a shock to her when I say no. Her going may be a blessing because it will give me time to start finding an apartment to rent. My lawyer has already served the hospital demanding the proof that the operation took place and is in contact with the health insurance company for their records. The surgeon who did the work is being sued in order to get it confirmed that there was no real medical reason to have it done. I think he will quickly comply because otherwise, it's going to end up costing him a lot of money in court and legal fees. You're that sure that your marriage is over? Bridget asked seriously. Bridget, this may sound liking I'm preaching, but in today's society with all the mistruths being spread around, it's become acceptable to lie, not take responsibility, blame someone else, and a whole lot of things that are not moral or right, but now are considered socially acceptable, I said. You as an average Joe can't sue for slander anymore because of the legal costs which make it easier for these ones to promote their untruths in every way. If you can't be honest about yourself and what you're doing how can you be honest to anyone else, I said. I won't lie about myself or to anyone else for any reason. It may be outdated and old-fashioned, but it makes me, me. Yet Dinah, when confronted, will expect me to accept her lies, live them, pay for them, and just go along with them. She won't admit to doing anything. 
She would explain that what she said was taken the wrong way or out of context. It's her belief that it's no big deal as everybody in New York is doing it to some degree. I guess it's my problem because I have to look at myself in the mirror in the morning. I said, as a result, my marriage was dead the moment I found out that our marriage was nothing but a bunch of lies. Hearing from her own mouth what she did to herself, for herself killed any of the love I had left. It puzzled me to see that what I had said had put a huge smile on Bridget's face. To a lot of people in this room your words make you a bigot or a hater, Bridget said. I agree with you fully, but most won't. Should I lower my principles, morals, and standards just to help them justify their hate towards me, I asked. The moment I do they have one and prove to themselves that everyone who believes differently can be converted to their point of view. Bridget leaned in towards me and whispered, I'm looking forward to getting to know you a lot better. You're definitely showing me that you're not what Dinah had led me to believe. The waitress had brought us our meal. We both had large T-bone steaks, a Greek salad, and garlic mashed potatoes. I joked that the mashed potatoes were not pure because they didn't have little lumps in them. Trey, that is just what my dad would say, Bridget said with a smile. He will get a kick out of it when I tell him that. We left once we were done, and since there was no rush to get back, both Bridget and I took a stroll down the street. Bridget made sure that as we took a stroll that I was on the outside. We stopped at a street florist and I bought her six yellow roses. To celebrate our blooming friendship. It was well after three when we finally separated to finish off the workday. For some reason, I just could not get back into the groove of things when I returned to my desk. My mind was on a certain redhead who had just set up a future date with me very slyly. Our budding relationship, whatever it was, was starting to get interesting. I was prepared for what I knew was coming when I got home. As I got out of my suit, my better half was getting dressed as she was expected out at another social event that evening. Dinah pulled out her request shortly after I got finished changing and wanted me to get right on it on Monday. I frankly told her there was no way I could get the time off because we were nearing the tax time and I had to be there to answer any questions that my clients might have. Dinah was definitely not expecting my refusal and visibly showed her complete dissatisfaction with me. Besides with the up and down swings on the stock market lately because a lot of idiots with little or no knowledge panic it's best that I stay near until some sort of stability returns to the market, I explained. When you get idiots acting on feelings instead of using accurate knowledge, all sorts of problems can arise. Who am I going to get to go with me? Dinah asked. On this short of notice. I'm sure that one of the boy toys in your entourage that follow you around will gladly go with you, I said. After all, according to the New York Times gossip columns, there have been rumors that you have slept with a few of them. Let me tell you that there is no truth to those rumors, Dinah said. I have been faithful since the day we got engaged. If that is true, then why haven't these ones denied it? I asked. On second thought, why haven't you? I just did, Dinah said starting to show her anger. I opened the New York Times and went to the Gossip Lady's daily column and started to read out loud. Dinah Richards and six of her growing entourage were seen leaving the latest showing of Hamilton Wednesday night. It was brought out that they were there to cheer Ms. Richards up who is apparently having marital problems with her husband who has been fashionable missing from Ms. Richards' arms for quite a few months. Those in the know are beginning to wonder if he still exists. Has Ms. Richards open and a very public lifestyle began taking its toll on another one of her personal relationships. It's looking like one of her boy toys who are always with her might have stepped up to be more than that. None who are always with her that I have talked to are denying that thought. Inquiring minds wonder if her husband knows what the truth is. I think I have read enough to get the picture, I said. Don't you? But it's not true, Dinah said trying to defend herself unsuccessfully. There has to be some truth to it, I said. After all it's printed in the New York Times. That's why it's the best-selling paper in the city. Perhaps you planted it yourself, that's why the writer makes it sound so creditable. I wonder what your dad thinks. Perhaps I should call and ask him. I got an idea you can tweet all your followers and ask if the New York Times is telling the truth. After all, over a million of your followers can't be wrong. I started to walk away heading towards my home office. I heard Dinah slam the bedroom door behind me. She would act out her anger on somebody tonight because I knew she wasn't happy. I had just thrown the publicity she craved for right in her face. Dinah had a lot of thinking to do. What I knew is the truth didn't matter because the public perception was showing what her lifestyle was implying. If they were saying she was nothing but a 304 who was I to say that the New York Times was lying? I was using it to make Dinah believe that I was buying the media hype just like most of the newspaper's readers. If you created the perception most would accept it as the truth no matter what. After all, if the New York Times the most liberal paper in the country was implying that she was nothing more than a married hooker, they had to have the proof to back it up, wouldn't they? 
I stayed in my office until some of her entourage had picked her up. Unknown to me at the time as soon as Dinah had left the house, she called Bridget to inform her that we had just gone through a very serious argument that she didn't know how to resolve. Dinah explained to Bridget that I was not looking at our situation the way that I should. Bridget said that perhaps she was getting a taste of what she deserved for not treating her husband better. How many nights have you left Trey alone, she asked while you're off building your dream. What else is Trey supposed to think, because not once have you publicly denied it. When you're out and about in party mode, who knows what's going on? Has your sexual relationship with Trey cooled off drastically in the last few months? Is it because your eyes are elsewhere? Dinah didn't dare say a word because it had. She had been totally neglecting me. Bridget hit her hard before telling Dinah about the very romantic luncheon she had with her newest romantic interest. Pointing out it was nice to have a romantic afternoon with a man who wasn't after something. She was totally surprised by him because he was not at all like she had been led to believe. In fact, the two of us have agreed to go to an out-of-state party next month. Dinah realized that Bridget had somehow found someone that seriously perked her interest because she had never been that aggressive in her relationship with a man before. Dinah was dying to find out all about him. Dinah was learning that she was no longer Bridget's center of attention and wanted to know the juicy details. All Bridget would tell her was that she had received six exquisite yellow roses from him that she was carrying with her from room to room. It must have bugged Dinah all night knowing that her best friend who had been in going nowhere relationships for years was developing one that apparently had a future. I called the tip line for the gossip lady and left the thought that when Dinah went to Paris, France next week, she would not be going alone and that man that was going with would be sharing the same suite. It might be a good idea if a contact in Paris could keep her informed as to what was going on. After making myself some supper and throwing the dishes in the dishwasher, I began the task of moving all my personal items from our bedroom into the spare bedroom. I was starting to separate my life from hers while I waited on the lawyers. I knew her deliberate action had forever destroyed her credibility with me. When Dinah got home in the early hours of the next morning, she discovered I wasn't in our bed. Before she got up that Saturday morning I had dressed in blue jeans and gone to the office. I did leave a note on the kitchen counter saying that I needed to work because it was so busy and I just to catch up, so I was ready for what happened on Monday. It also helped to validate my reasons for not doing what she wanted. It was around 11 that I got inspired by a spot of ingeniousness. I went out to an instant teller to get cash. Then I went to the nearest florist. I ordered a dozen red roses for Bridget Smith and had it delivered to our home address paying for it with cash. The card said from a secret admirer. If I knew Dinah, Bridget would be holding her hand by the time they arrived. I had just made it back to my office when the office phone rang. It was Dinah. What do you want Dinah? I said with a cold voice. Why did you move out of our bedroom last night? she asked meekly. Because of the article about us published in the Times, I said. It's nothing but rumors you can't be taking it seriously, Dinah said. Dinah, I think you should be asking yourself, how can I prove to my husband that I am not having an affair? I said with seriousness. Right now, I can't say with your current lifestyle that you're not because you're always away from home until the wee hours of the morning with some flavor of eye candy on your arm doing God knows what. Since you don't normally explain things to me about your conduct with these men last few months, what am I to believe? Maybe you have decided that variety is the spice of life. What's written in the New York Times forces me to believe that you are. Besides, why would the New York Times write about it if you weren't? I hung up the phone without saying another word knowing that Dinah, who had to be in complete control, would be starting to panic. Her own plan to use gossip, publicity, and rumors to advance her social presence and following were blowing up in her face. I had made it clear to her that I had accepted the public's perception and believed something was going on that shouldn't be. I had tactfully said it all without calling her a hooker. Here she was on the verge of landing a huge sponsor and having her marriage starting to blow up in her face. She could not afford it at this time to have the public perception of her affected in any way. It could end up costing her millions if it did. She was now treading in a minefield created by herself, and she knew it. If my gut was telling me right Dinah would be calling Bridget to come over and help her work, her situation out. I had never questioned Dinah's conduct before. Now I was, and she had no way of disproving what I was implying. Her problem was she had no clue as to why I was really acting like I was. I had gone through the closing figures on the stock market for Friday and had been researching out a few stocks that I thought might be having a really good day on Monday. Each person working the stock market floor doing the actual trading would leave behind an unfished list for the start of the market the next day. Using that knowledge, I had gleamed I found a trader who had what I wanted so I put a buy offer at the price they were asking. If my thoughts were right, both the stocks I wanted would jump just after opening. If the deal was accepted, it would be entered into the computer and completed at the opening. 
The amount I had spent was well within the parameters my clients had set. I also bought enough shares to spend what I had made for myself over the last week. Bridget later texted me. Flowers are beautiful, thank you. At your house. Dinah is in a dizzy because she doesn't know how to fix her situation. Can't cancel or postpone the trip. She asked me how she could prove she isn't having an affair when the social media she depends on says that she is. Brilliant move on your part. Pressuring me for info about my new romantic interest. It's interesting that what I have told her about you, she doesn't recognize at all. She has an event she has to go to so she will be gone by 5 and won't be home until the wee hours of the morning. I was just about to head out at 4 o'clock when my cell phone went off. It was Emerson Stevens, Dinah's father. Hi, Dad, I said. What's going on? As you know, my wife reads the gossip column regularly, he said. The comment about our daughter's Wednesday night was particularly troubling to her. Is there any truth to the story? Until a couple of weeks ago, I would have automatically said no, I said. But I learned something that has forced me to hire a team to verify or disprove what was said. Until I get to the truth about that situation, I have to say I honestly don't know. It's that serious, Dad said. Dad, it came from Dinah's own mouth. I overheard a conversation she was having with our next-door neighbor. I said. The neighbor gave me a notarized statement verifying what I heard. I promise I will let you know what I find out as long as you don't shoot the messenger. Has what she said affected the marriage? He asked. To answer your question, it's so serious that I felt that I had no choice but to move into the spare bedroom, I said. Dinah doesn't know that I know what she said, and I am checking things out to verify or disprove what she may have had done. You can't tell me anymore, my father-in-law asked. I can email you a copy of the statement, but you can't tell your wife, I said. When you go through the statement, you will understand why. I quickly emailed him, Bridget Smith's statement. It wasn't five minutes until he called me back. His anger was easily discerned by the foul language coming out of his mouth. Dad, you got to understand, Dinah had the operation to tie her tubes after she told us the doctors had informed her. She couldn't get pregnant, I said. It has raised a lot of questions in my mind. My lawyers and I are waiting for a few court orders so that we can find out what the actual truth is. So, if she couldn't get pregnant anyway, why did she get her tubes tied? He asked. To protect herself and make sure the lie she had told us became true, I said. The line went dead. So, I turned the speaker on and waited for a few in case it had not been a dropped call. Trey, I lost it. If what you believe is proven to be true, divorce her, I would, he said. I know you wanted a family with children just as much as her mother, and I were looking forward to having grandchildren to spoil. Well, she's leaving for Paris next week, and I won't be going, I said. She's found a luxury company that wants to use her as a spokesperson for their products. If she signs it, she won't need me for anything anymore. I'm beginning to believe that she is trying to destroy our marriage because my usefulness to her is done. For Emerson Stevens, the information he had just received had to be tearing him apart. Dinah's words and conduct were forming a path that most would follow because it came across as logical. She was leading them down a path with a pattern of behavior that forced one to draw certain types of conclusions. Once again, I started to pack up and head for home. I was pleased with how the day went. I had just reset the alarm and locked the door when my cell phone went off. It was Bridget. How long is it going to take you to get home? She asked. I'll be there by seven, why? I asked, what's going on? I'm at your house ready to put a large roast chicken in the oven, so I need to time it. So the meal is ready when you come into the house, Bridget said. If you have the time, pick up a nice white wine. I think the Uber driver must have broken a few speed laws on the way home because I could not remember the last time. I had a home-cooked meal. Home cooking didn't exist in Dinah's eyes. There is nothing like the smell of food cooking in the oven to welcome you home. I had picked a nice couple of bottles of white wine to complement the meal. Bridget had gone over top the roast chicken was cooked to perfection. Its skin was brown and crisp. Yes, the mashed potatoes had lumps I noticed them and said so, but they were still rich, thick, fluffy, and perfect. The salad was served with its own vinaigrette, so you could pour on enough to satisfy your own tastes. I gladly overate because the food was so good. For some reason, Bridget seemed to enjoy watching me eating everything until there was nothing left on the bone. How were you able to pull all of this off? I asked. I got Dinah to convince me that my talking to you in private might help calm the situation down. She offered to order and pay for the food. Bridget explained. I suggested this and she went for it saying it was the perfect thing to get Trey to unwind and relax. Perhaps it will allow you to change his thinking, so that he will be open to listening to my reasoning. I shook my head trying to adjust to the fact that Dinah didn't even question the idea that Bridget 
and I would be alone over dinner in a very private setting. I told Dad what was going on with Dinah and you, Bridge said. He now understands why the statement I provided you is so important. My dad wants to meet you as soon as possible. I think he wants to see for himself if you're the type of man he thinks you are. We can do that as soon as Dinah finds out that your father and you are my clients, I said. Dinah's father called me just before you did. His wife had seen the remarks in the gossip article, and he needed clarification so he could reassure his wife that they were not true. I ended up sending him a copy of your statement. How did he take it? Bridget asked. About as good as I did, I said. I had to tell him that he would be the first to know what the proof showed when I got it. He now knows I have moved into the second bedroom. His final thought is if what she said can be proved that I'd better get the divorce as soon as possible. Bridget took my hand, smiled and whispered, I will be standing right beside you to help you through it. Dinah spent more time today trying to find out who my admirer is than dealing with you in her situation. It shows us what is really important to her. That says a lot in itself, I said. I'm just upset with the fact that I didn't see it before now. After dinner, we cleaned up and then went into the living room to watch pay-for-view movies. We were interested in three and ended up watching them all while working on finishing off the wine. All in all, it had been a long time since I had enjoyed such a relaxing evening. It felt strange to me to have a woman sitting very close beside me eager and sharing something so simple. It was after 1 am when we called it a night. I walked her home and waited until she had gone in before leaving. Once again, she left me with a tender kiss on my cheek. I was puzzled because I still was not connecting the dots. I laid on the bed in the spare bedroom looking back at what had transpired over the last week since I had heard Bridget and Dinah's conversation. Things were changing. Bridget was checking up on me daily while Dinah and I were not talking. I knew that Dinah was trying to figure out how to manage the situation without really dealing with it until she got back. Bridget was deliberately trying to draw herself into my life in a personal way and I did not know why. Bridget was a redhead whose natural beauty I could look at for hours. So far, she had proven that I could trust her, but I was looking at her with skepticism because of her close relationship with Dinah. I knew for now with both I had to tread carefully. Until I had more information, I really did not know what to believe. Dinah got home about three and had to be back out by nine. Her day would be spent buying the image she wanted for Paris. It had to be very upper class and expensive. All her entourage would be following her, taking pictures, posting them, magnifying the situation making it seem bigger than it was. It was the hype she wanted for the trip. There would be a lot of sexual flirtation going on which her followers would feed on. She wanted them to be sure to follow her while she was overseas. I managed to avoid her until she left the house by pretending to be still asleep. For men who were part of her entourage had picked her up. Most of them were part of the upper society's children. I had just started a pot of coffee when my cell phone rang. It was Bridget. How does bacon, eggs, toast? homemade pan-fried potatoes, and orange juice sound, she asked. It sounds great, let's go out and get some, I said. I can be ready in 10. Make it 15, she replied. The potatoes I just boiled need to cool down before I can cut and fry them in butter with the cast iron frying pan. That gave me time to have a quick shower and shave. So, I did it and got dressed in my casual best. As I walked over, I found myself feeling like a kid in a candy store for the first time. Two home-cooked meals in less than three days had me asking myself what I have done right to be blessed like this. I knocked on the door. Bridget answered by yelling doors unlocked come on in. My first impression of Bridget's home that it was a home built and designed to be filled with comfort and love. While Dinah's and mine were designed to impress the unexpected who dropped in. For some reason, after breakfast, I was in no hurry to go anywhere because I had not felt this comfortable in a long time. Little did I realize that seeds were being planted that would affect a lot of people's lives. It had been a busy week. On Monday the stock market took off like I thought it would. I made good money for my clients and me. Once again, I had proved to myself that I had done my job and successfully done my homework. Every day this week Bridget and I met for lunch to discuss what was going on in our day. Every night I took home little thank you gifts from clients who had a lot of extra money thanks to me. For Dinah and me when we were home together it was ice cold. I wouldn't give an inch until she could prove that she was not involved with someone else. Dinah said I was being a stubborn pig about our situation because she had done nothing wrong and felt she did not have to answer to anyone. I said we shall see about that. The New York Times gossip reporter had captured Dinah and the boy toy she got to go with her boarding the plane on Wednesday afternoon. He was now totally outed according to the paper as her latest romantic interest. It looked like the gossip reporter had taken the bait. She also now had part of Dinah's entourage public saying that Dinah and I had to be in an open marriage for a few years. 
It had been a mutual decision between the two of us to keep our lifestyle choices private. Those who were in the know knew it to be total bullshit. They had a close-up of Dinah's left hand lacking her wedding rings just before she loaded the plane. When I was contacted about the article as it was printed all I said, well, if it's in the New York Times, it must be the truth that Dinah is telling everybody. If it is, it's news to me because it was never discussed with me. Somehow my comments had got back to the gossip lady. She had a whole piece on my personal views about Dinah's and my relationship. Amazingly, she had never talked to me. Those who read it just assumed she had. The perception was that I had just found out about being dumped in such a public way and was having a hard time coming to terms with it. I got phone calls from both of my in-laws concerned about my well-being because of it. Emerson Stevens called me on Friday, trying to figure out what his daughter was doing. I replied proving my feelings right. He threatened to lower the boom on his daughter right away. I got him calmed down and told him that until we get actual proof that can't be denied. The truth means nothing because perception meant everything. Besides the truth means nothing except to a few. Most will buy the views of the media without question. For now, although Dinah feels she was in the driver's seat, she had no clue about what her family knows. Her meeting with the prospective new client was on Monday. They would be whining and dining her for the next few days to smooth her into signing. It was going to be promoted to the extreme because free publicity meant everything. For both sides, it made it possible for big money to be made without much cost. I wondered if the boy toy on her arms would be stupid enough to make a serious move upon my loving and apparently willing wife. Dinah had learned from Bridget just the day before she left that I was now becoming her father and her financial advisor. Quietly behind the drama, Bridget was making her move. Somehow, she got Dinah's blessing to keep my mind off our situation until she was able to return to deal with it. Dinah still thought we could resolve our differences if she could sit down and lead me through it. All she thought she had to do was to set my thinking right about what the media was reporting. The updates from my divorce lawyer were looking good. The background material she was gathering was outstanding. The hospital and health insurance company had both provided documented proof that the operation to have her tubes tied had taken place. The surgeon's lawyer was now in negotiations to resolve the issue to our satisfaction. Thursday night Bridget and I spent an evening together. I found it enjoyable being just us. As a result, I got informed by Bridget late Friday afternoon that she would like me to spend the day with her doing something she always wanted to do. I pointed out it would not look good for her to be with a married man for that long. She said, Dinah gave me her approval for us to spend as much time together as possible. I ended up scratching my head on that. When she told me what she had planned for us to do on Saturday, I readily agreed because it had been something I had thought of doing but never had. The chance to go with someone just as interested in it as I was, was something I could not say no to. My in-laws had me go out for dinner with them that night, just to make sure that I was not hiding from them what was really going on with me. My mother-in-law who loved me dearly was very concerned and made it clear that her support of me was unshakable. I picked Bridget up at 9am on Saturday and off we went to Coney Island. We spent the day at the New York Aquarium going through three of its exhibits, the Aqua Theater, Conservation Hall, and Ocean Wonders. For both of us, it was the first time we had been there. It was fun to discuss the things we were seeing as we both were developing new interests together while learning more about each other. It was a fun relaxing day because we both agreed to shut our cell phones off and leave them locked in the glove box. It's nice when you share a day with someone you respect because it ends up drawing you closer. Not having the phone constantly bothering you was refreshing. It seemed to be a day we both needed for different reasons. With the stresses of life going all with us we set it all aside and focused on being comfortable with each other. It was nice watching some parents get caught up by the wonderment of their children and the things that they were seeing. At these times Bridget would hold my hand extra tight as if she was trying to protect me. I think she was thinking that seeing children was reminding me of what my wife Dinah had done. Before we called it a day, we took a walk down the boardwalk as dusk was coming in. Even though it was a cool evening we seemed to be oblivious to it as we were lost in the joy of each other's company. At one end we were sitting at an all-night pizzeria sharing a freshly made pizza with a couple of drafts. When I dropped her off and walked her to her door, she invited me in, but I declined by saying, my heart wants to but I best not. Two wrongs don't make a right. Before I do anything, I want to be sure it's for the right reasons. So, until I have served her because I know where we would end up, I will discipline myself because I don't want anything to cheapen what we have. That is why I haven't made a move. With that, I wrapped her into my arms leaving her with a deep tongue exchanging a kiss as her body seemed to fold into mine. It blew me away because it was the first time I had ever experienced that. I didn't realize that in Bridget's eyes the dance of romance between the two of us was already in full swing. My words to her conveyed my deep respect for her as a person. 
I would later learn that she had texted her mom before going to bed to tell her that she had just experienced one of the most romantic days in her life. A second text to her a few minutes explained that she felt like she was falling in love. I slept in on Sunday having nothing planned, but doing some things around the house. Once I got the coffee brewing, I threw a load of laundry in. I finally turned my cell phone on after having a bite to eat. Since it was going to be a nice mild day, I was going to rake and fertilize the yard. I had a text message from Bridget. It read, Thank you for yesterday. It was a wonderful day. It surprised me to find it totally relaxing to be with you. You left me feeling totally content for the first time in a long time. To be honest, it's a feeling that I could get used to. When I hit the pillow, I was out instantly. My dad's text woke me up this morning. He wants to meet you sometime today if that's possible. Let me know if that's okay. I thought about what she said while I poured myself another coffee and reflected on our relationship so far. Once I decided I called her, Bridget answered right away. Good morning. I'm going to need two hours to rake the lawn otherwise the rest of the day I'm free, I said. And I have to agree with your text because I felt the same way. I'm still wearing the smile you put on my face. Bridget said she would talk to her dad and let me know what the arrangement would be. I made myself a couple of bacon and egg sandwiches to eat before starting to work. I had finished the front yard and was working on the back. Being warm blood, even though the temperature was in the 40s, I was working shirtless. I could not help noticing that Bridget was watching me work as she drank a hot beverage out of a mug. When done I went and laid the fertilizer down. I had gone back inside to have a coffee before cleaning up when I saw a text from Bridget waiting for me. It read we're going for supper at my parents. Attached was a picture she had taken of me while I worked out in the yard. I texted back, what should I wear? She replied, clothes would be appropriate. Mom might have a heart attack if you walked in half naked. I typed back, smart ass. She responded, giggling, blue jeans fine, not a working day. Pick me up at four. As soon as we were out of the neighborhood, Bridget slid over from her side of the front seat to be right beside me saying, I could get used to this. I laughed. I would drive the car more if it didn't cost so much for bridge tolls and parking. That's why I haven't replaced it. Can't justify the extra expense because of the cost of public transit. You don't like the city, do you? Bridget noted. I've never felt like I fit in. My roots are from a farm in the Midwest, I said. OMG, that's where my dad started too, Bridget said. When he officially retires at 65, he's moving back. He claims it's a different style of life back there. Bridget got quiet. I wondered why finally I asked her, what are you thinking about? I spent years trying to find the right man to fall in love with, Bridget said. Being with you, talking with you has made me realize that the man I was looking for couldn't have grown up here on the East Coast. There's something about your inner soul that sets my dad and you apart from most who grow up locally. I found that making friends even with neighbors is getting harder in our society on the coast, I said. Look how long it took for us to get to know each other. Just going to and getting back from work each day takes four hours. Here to protect themselves most speak in half-truths and don't open up. My father used to frustrate his staff to no ends because he would not stay a minute longer than absolutely necessary, she replied. The rest could wait until tomorrow. His home life came first. Funny that you would say that, my dad used to say. If a man is working long hours, he is looking for an excuse not to go home. When you see someone doing that you know their marriage is over, but they have not realized it. I said, I just realized that he could have been talking about me. I guess that explains how long I should have known that Dinah and my marriage was dead. It's a good thing I had punched her parents' address into the Google Maps because Bridget leaned her head on my shoulder and was soon fast asleep. To most, it would not mean anything but to me it said everything because to me it conveyed her trust in me. A fact that was noticed by her parents when we pulled into their driveway. She awoke as I brought my vehicle to a stop. Clarence Smith and his wife were a nice-looking couple. I could clearly see that Bridget took after her mother. If Bridget looked as good as she did at her age, the man who would end up being married to her was one lucky feller. Before we got into the house introductions were made, Clarence led me off to the kitchen so we could grab us a cold beer. He offered me a Bud Light, a regular Miller, or a Stout. I said the stout if I could be allowed to pour it myself into a beer glass. He took out two and then opened up the fridge freezer to take out two frosted mugs out. After pouring out our own, we sat at the kitchen table. I want to thank you personally for giving my daughter the information you did, he said. She also told me about your situation, so I wanted to see how you're handling it. One day at a time. For now, it's a waiting game until the lawyer confirms and gets to the truth. Once we have it, she will be kicked to the curve. I won't live her life of lies and I'm sure in her eyes I am not worth changing her ways for. I said, I will be going for an annulment instead of a divorce because as it looks now, that I was conned into the marriage. 
And your relationship with my daughter for now? Clarence asked. Strictly platonic until my divorce is granted. Although I know in her own way, she has been trying her hardest to slowly rope me in, I said. And sir, more importantly, she knows that this is the way it has to be. If I expect honesty, I have to show it too. Clarence smiled. My daughter said I would be pleasantly surprised by you. I must admit that she is right. I knew the first time she talked about you, by the way. Her face lit up that there was more than just a casual interest in you. Thank you for making it clear that you're not going to take advantage of her because many would. Off the record, sir. Anyone who took the time needed to really know your daughter as I have these last few weeks would find her easy to love. I said, you should be proud you raised her well. It was at that moment that Bridget and her mother joined us. I could see that Bridget seemed nervous, but as soon as she saw the look on her father's face it began to dispel. I took the time to discuss my plans about their investments going forward and chastised her father for not setting up a retirement account for his wife and using it to his advantage. I explained that sometimes we get so busy in life that we overlook the obvious. Sir, I saw the size of your bonuses to your upper management last year, and I am ashamed to tell you there's a better way, I said. Give them a choice by suggesting that they direct the corporation to directly deposit it into their retirement account thus giving them the opportunity of avoiding losing it to the tax department because it boots them into a higher tax rate. Bridget, your man pulls no punches, he tells it straight. That is so refreshing to see, Clarence said. As he said earlier, he thinks you're trying to rope him in. You both have my approval going forward to see where your relationship goes. Both Bridget and her mom teared up. I was sitting there wondering why. Later as we fired the barbecue up, he explained why. I had you checked out when my daughter first mentioned you, so I knew you were married. When she presented me with the confidential information about your firm, I asked why. She said she had to talk to you first when she did. She told me the whole story. It conveyed to me the trust you two were developing in each other. It gave me a good idea of what kind of man you were, he explained. Your approach to me today proved to me that what I thought was right. You had no clue as to what I knew, yet you hid nothing. It was obvious to me that you were not raised in this city that added to your credibility. I laughed and said, when you get stuck in the Missouri red clay, you realize that no matter how smart you think you are, you are never really in control because God does have a sense of humor and at his time he will show it to you just to keep you humble. Clarence laughed and said, to the south, you're not south enough to the north, you're not the north, you're the south. Back home was the show me state. And to those from there that says it all, Trey, you have shown me well. On the way back to our homes as Bridget sat beside me, I realized that her parents believed their daughter was in love with me. I knew I had to tread carefully. Human emotions should not be played with as I had been reminded the hard way from Dinah. I had spent most of the weekend with Bridget, and it had been two of the best days I had spent in a long time. It had shown me what life could be like if I worked for it. The more I saw the possibility of it, the more I wanted it. Surprising the week at work was quiet and steady. It allowed me the chance to review all of my clients' accounts to ensure there was steady growth. On a few, I had to make a few minor adjustments, but that was normal. Although we didn't talk during working hours, Bridget kept checking on me via short texts. Every night until bedtime we were together. If we were at my place, I walked her home. I had given my word to her father and had taken the relationship no further. If Bridget would have had her way, we would have gone a lot farther. Dinah had signed the agreement after four days of negations. For the next five years, she would be making millions. The luxury company was the fourth that had come on board. Her tweets and self-promotion with her perception of things was, and would remain a market-driving force for all concerned. Sad in building her marketing empire, she had built herself into a box that she could get out of. She was about to realize that all her scheming, manipulations, and misdirection to present a certain perception to the masses was the trap that going to end up hurting her the most because it was taking a life of its own. The gossip lady's contacts had not disappointed. Everything Dinah and her boy toy did had made the printed pages back here in the New York Times every day creating quite a few Twitter discussions causing more to follow her because everyone wanted to keep up on it. To some, this was like watching the soap operas on TV. It had been a week of them doing nothing but flaunting their relationship in a very public way. Although there might have not been any sexual activity between the two. Their contact, the physical touching, the soft, sensual kisses left on cheeks, the eye contact, and gestures implied that theirs was a new love in full bloom. The mass media was presenting it here as a spring Paris romance story. The perception of the New York Times gossip pages was that Dinah Richards had thrown away her marriage, and even though they had separate suits they were adjoined. The hotel maid, it had been rumored had supposedly confirmed that only one bed was used by the two. Since it was published in the New York Times it had to be true. After all, in the public's eyes, 
the New York Times never lies. As soon as she cleared customs that Friday morning Dinah Richards was served, it had been confirmed that there had been no need for Dinah to have medically had her tubes tied. Until that point, Dinah was completely functional and had been capable of carrying children full term. I had my lawyer courier Emerson Stevens a copy. The New York Times gossip reporter was there to capture it. So was a news crew assigned to one of the local Saturday morning talk shows. When the reporter asked Dinah all about it, she claimed it was all a huge misunderstanding. That once she talked it all out with her husband Trey, Richards the misunderstanding would be straightened out. After all, we have an open marriage, so all this was, was a little fun on the side. The reporter responded for more than a week, you appear to be flaunting your relationship with your boy toy. The perception is that you dumped your husband for a week of sexual pleasure in the city of romance. They caught a picture of Dinah's face going white and published it online the same day. The New York Times gossip reporter stated the only reason that Dinah Richards' face went white was that she believed she would not be caught. Dinah called Bridget as soon as she could, who listened to her claim that this was all a mistake. Bridget suggested the first thing she should do is go online and read the social pages of the New York Times from the day she left. It will show you the truths that we who know you have now come to believe. If the New York Times published it, it has to be the truth. About two hours later Bridget answered her cell phone. What do you want Dinah? I read the articles and they have been spun all the wrong way, Dinah said. What we did was for the publicity, none of it was real. Dinah, you took of your wedding rings before you even left. That said more than anything else. Your problem is that no one will believe you no matter what you say, Bridget stated. Have you read Trey's divorce petition? If not, read it because your denial even to most of your followers comes across as the lie. We all know that if the New York Times prints it, it must be the truth, otherwise why would much of what they say be carried by the television stations nationwide, Bridget added. Their words are quoted and supported by most of them. Why? I haven't had time. I've come home to find everything a mess, she replied. Trey overheard you telling me about having your tubes tied, Bridget said. He hired a lawyer to get to the truth. When you read the papers, you were served with you will see what he found out. He's going for an annulment because he believes you lied and conned him into marriage. But his thinking is all wrong. I married him because I did love him, Dinah said. Dinah your own lies and conduct have caught up to you and forced him to see what you really are. Your action has destroyed what little love he had left for you. He was so upset he even talked to your father and mother, Bridget said. They told him to divorce you because what you did to all of them is unforgivable. They too have had enough of your bullshit. Oh God, what am I going to do? Dinah wondered. My drive for monetary success has led to this. It was my friendship with one of the editors of the New York Times who taught me how to manipulate things so that the general public would accept it as the truth. It has taken four years, but it worked amazingly well. It was made perfectly clear by that editor that perception had more influence and power than anything else. Live with it, Bridget said. Those perceptions have cost you your marriage, your relationship with your parents, and now our friendship. I can't believe I bought your BS. It's too late for the truth to have a value in your case because you by your actions have made it worthless. So please don't call me again. I don't like what you did and who you have become. To satisfy your own goals you deliberately hurt and use the ones you claim to love. I have had to ask myself if you did this to them out of love what would you do to those you hate? Dinah had failed to understand that the power of perception came with the influence of suggestion caused by presenting something in such a way that one's perception accepted it without question as to be the truth. It was a tool used by the mass media to attempt to sway elections, beliefs, and understandings quite effectively to satisfy their agenda and create hype and tension out of simple things. They knew that most of the population was too lazy to search out the facts their truths became what the mass media wanted them to believe. It was that perception that governed the masses. Lies and truths were only used to aid the promotion of the perception they wanted the masses to believe. The reason they did it was to gain readerships or viewers to increase the profit of their organizations. Only higher numbers of followers would satisfy their greed. Dinah realized that she had one chance, and that was talking to me. I was just leaving the office for the day when the receptionist informed me that my wife was there to see me. I said I would be right out. I went out carrying the framed picture of her that I had on my desk. Stopping in front of her, I said, Do you want this? Dinah said, No. Handing it to the receptionist, I said, Could you please throw this picture in the trash, as neither one of us has any reason to keep it? Dinah got teary eyed and said, can we go somewhere private and talk? No need. I wouldn't believe a thing you said. I said as I took off my wedding ring handing it to her. You can put this with yours wherever you have it hidden because I can see it's not on your hand. That tells me all I need to know. 
Our marriage ended the moment you told Bridget what you had done and why. What you didn't know was that I was working underneath our deck and heard it. You made it clear in what you said and did that you had to make sure your lies became the truth. If I talked to you, it would just be more of your mind games. Email me where you want your personal belongings sent to. The rest can be decided by the lawyers. Don't contact me again. We're done because the New York Times and you have humiliated me enough. To many of your followers, I'm nothing but a laughing stock. I said in a raised voice, telling all via the New York Times that what you were doing was acceptable because we had an open marriage was just like you because it was over the top, like so much of your BS it had no basis of truth, I said. And like all you have done it had nothing to do with the facts. The New York Times made it quite clear that you were enjoying your romantic fling with your boy toy in Paris. I'm sure it will be accepted as a fact in divorce court. After all, if the New York Times reports it, it must be the truth. Without a further word, I went to the elevator and called for one to come. The receptionist couldn't believe what she was seeing. She had never seen me act this cold to anyone. I could hear Dinah sobbing as I walked away. As I waited, I heard the office receptionist say, Ms. Richards, you're no longer recognized as being acceptable in this office. Please leave and never return. The next time I see you here, I will call building security and have you escorted out. I won't allow a woman like you to smell up this place. Trey Richards is the most respected person in this office and a friend to us all. None of us find it humorous that you used the New York Times to end your marriage. He did not deserve being dumped by you in such a pubic way. Dinah was shocked. She hadn't dumped her husband as far as she was concerned, but the office receptionist believed she did. As I rode down the elevator, I removed her from my contacts on my cell phone. By the time I had got to the bottom, she had called. Before evening answering her, I had blocked her calls. I went into settings and shut the GPS off because I knew that with it turned on my phone would be easy to track. All it would take was someone with a bit of intelligence with the right kind of app. I was headed to the subway which would take me to the nearest exit so I could catch the bus home when Bridget called. Dinner at 7 my house. I'm already home. I took the afternoon off after I heard the great news directly from Dinah that she'd been served. You could have told me, she said. Pick up some red wine as I got a roast of beef already in the oven. Sounds good, I said with excitement. I will take a taxi after I get the wine, so I should be early. It was about half an hour walk to my favorite beverage store. I bought two bottles of a better quality of the red wine, a bottle of Crown Royal, and a two-liter bottle of Coke before flagging down a taxi. I was about ten minutes from home when Bridget texted me. Garage open run from the taxi in. Dinah and her entourage are at your home waiting for you. The situation does not look good. Taxis in New York are famous for dropping you at the curb. It took an extra 20 for him to agree to pull into the driveway. As soon as I ran in, she began shutting down the bay door. We were both hoping I wasn't seen because we both understood the Queen Bee was now a drama queen who had lost control. We both assumed that in Dinah's state of mind, and with her view of how marriage was supposed to be anything was possible. Make yourself at home, Bridget said, then pour us some of the wine. I'm going to change quickly in case what was going on was noticed. I did as Bridget asked. I undid the suit jacket and vest taking them off along with my tie. Undid three buttons on my shirt. Before getting the wine glasses out I rolled up my sleeves. Let me tell you that there are times that you wish you were elsewhere. This was not one of them because right in front of me I knew I was seeing the kind of life I wanted. When Bridget returned, she took my breath away. She had let her red hair down, removed her makeup, and changed into sensual evening wear. The sheer full-length black nightgown was designed as if it were a fine screen allowing one a glimpse of her sweet flesh. I could spend hours worshipping her body. My instant hard-on told us both I was caught in a losing battle. Bridget's bright eyes showed me that she was pleased with my automatic response. We had just kissed and were sharing the first taste of the medium wine I had bought when there was a knock at the door. I moved from the view of the front door as Bridget went to answer it. Hi, Dinah. What do you want? Bridget said. As you can see, I am kind of busy my boyfriend is here and is staying the night. It was noticed that a taxi dropped someone off at your house, Dinah said. Since Trey has not shown up, I instantly thought it might be him. So, you got one of your entourage watching my place. Why am I not surprised? When you talk to Trey do me a favor let him know that thanks to him my new relationship is working out great? Bridget requested. Even my parents have given us their blessing because they think he may be my perfect mate. My mom is already dreaming about babysitting the grandchildren. Is he someone we both know? Dinah asked. Based on what I now know about the man I'm falling in love with I would have to say definitely not, Bridget responded with truth as she closed the door in her face. She walked towards me trying to hold in her giggles. I held up my left hand to see if she would notice. She did. When did that happen? She asked. 
I told her what had transpired in the office before she went back into the bedroom to change because she was still cooking our dinner. When she came out, she discovered me peeling the potatoes she had set out for supper. We're going to have to figure out how to get me clean clothing, I said. Thank God I wear a standard size. You just might be stuck here until Monday, Bridget said. I don't think Dinah will be going anywhere this weekend because she believes you have to come home sometime. I guess she didn't get the message when you threw your wedding band in her face. Let me call my dad's tailor and see what he can deliver for you on short notice, Bridget said. I reached into my pocket and took out my wallet handing it to her, I said. Have him deliver a size 42 jacket, 34-inch waist, 30-inch leg length, shirts 15 and a half neck, vest and tie. Best out a second set and a pair of silk pajamas if he has it. Blue jeans, t-shirts, and whatever else I have not mentioned. What about underwear and socks? Bridget asked. Of course, I replied. Have it applied to my credit card. I listened as she placed the order. It was surprising what color she decided I would look good in. They said they would pull the order as soon as possible and it would be delivered in a rush via a courier within two hours if we were willing to pay the fee. It was fun working together as a couple finishing what she had started. Bridget seemed surprised at how adept I was in the kitchen. I set the table as she transferred the food into bowls and serving plates for the table, gravy made from drippings, Yorkshire pudding, mashed potatoes with lumps, corn on the cob, and of course the beef roast. Joking she said as the head of the house it's your job to slice the roast. So, I surprised her and did. I ate like a horse going back for seconds and thirds. I knew if she continued to feed me like this, I would end up rounder than boss hog. I told her so. Her response said it all because her face was glowing. After dinner as we cleaned up, she asked me if we had a small kitchenette at work. I told her yes, she said well then, I can pack you lunch on Sunday night for you to take with you on Monday. Doing the dishes together took a long time because we were doing a lot of kissing. I was impressed my new clothes were delivered within two hours. Bridget signed for them. We unpacked them in the living room. I was impressed the quality of the clothing was top-notch. The first three-piece suit came with an extra pair of pants and was a black pinstriped suit. The second a dark navy blue. I had enough new socks and underwear to last me for two weeks. Whoever had put the overall order together had color-coordinated it well. After removing all the packaging, price stickers and unneeded labels I asked her where I should put it and she said in your side of the master bedroom clothes closet. We carried them in together. I was surprised she hadn't used it all. I had lots of room to hang my two new suits. We hung the six new dress shirts and my blue jean shirts. The rest went onto empty shelves. She said I might as well get ready for bed since I was in here already. I gathered up my suit jacket, vest, and tie. As I undressed, I hung my suit up. I was thankful that she used ivory soap instead of a woman's scented one. I had a quick shower and put on clean new clothes. It was the first time I wore pajamas in years. Coming out of the bedroom, I said, Bridget, can I have a small garbage bag to put my laundry in? Just throw it in the laundry basket, she replied. We will have to do the laundry before Monday anyway. After doing just that as I came back out, she caught me in my black silk pajamas with her cell phone camera and set it for her lock screen. When Bridget came back out in the nightgown, she had worn earlier her underwear was missing. You would have to be a completed idiot not to see where this is going. Taking my hand in hers, she said, Before we go any further, I want to know your long-term plans are. I laughed and replied seriously, I want what your parents have. She looked at me with love in her eyes and said, It's taken them years of hard work together as a couple to get where they are now. I smiled, leaned down, wrapped my arms around her tight then kissed her with as much love and desire as I could before speaking. Do you think we can put the needs of the other first like they did? I guess I said the words she needed to hear because she responded in glee. I think that as a couple we are going to be having a lot of fun trying. Sometimes the most intimate thing you can do is just a little thing. For us it was not hopping into bed it was lying on the sofa cuddling each other, holding each other while sharing sweet tender kisses. The discovery of being a couple falling in love for all the right reasons was enough. We were still on the sofa when the knocking at the door rudely woke us up. It was after 10 a.m. in the morning. Bridget got up and went to answer the front door thankful that the chain lock was still on. Opening the door, the inch or two the chain allowed, she discovered it was Dinah. What do you want, Dinah? Bridget said in anger. You woke my intended and I out of a sound sleep. My husband Trey didn't come home last night and none of his conducts have seen him, Dinah said. I'm starting to get worried about him. I was wondering if you had heard from him. Too little too late, I'm afraid. I don't buy your worry, sorry, Bridget said. You publicly dump him via the New York Times, have your entourage say you have an open marriage, and do everything you can in Paris to prove it. The perception of your many followers proves it. 
The only question is why did it take three years to dump him? Look, I'm not going to argue with you about Trey, Dinah said. My parents read me the riot act last night too. I get it you all feel that I got what I deserve for what you all think I have done. Perhaps you're all right. Perhaps you're all wrong. There are always two sides to every story. Just let me know if you see him that he's all right. With that said, Bridget closed the door walked and walked back to me. I had found where the stuff was needed to make coffee and had started a pot. Do you think Dinah is really concerned? Bridget asked. There was no concern in her voice at all, I said. She's definitely trying to find out who you're with. It's a good thing I turned the GPS off otherwise she would know right where I was. It looks like she's trying to figure out how to manage the situation instead of facing it. Until she faces the truth, I'm afraid we still will be having problems going forth. We were sitting on the couch side by side enjoying our closeness, still lounging around in our bedtime clothes enjoying our first cup when a smile came across Bridget's face and with a giggle, she said, we going to have some fun today if I can get a little help. Picking up her cell phone she called her dad. Are you and mom doing anything important today? Bridget asked. I asked because Trey and I could use your help. The next thing I heard was Bridget said, yeah he's here, the divorce has started. Can you come to pick up his phone take it downtown before turning the GPS on and then hit different spots every hour? We think his phone's being tracked and if we're right it will give Trey a chance to get some of his personal belongings out of their house. Again, another pause then Bridget said, thanks we will see you in an hour. Bridget went and got dressed first, I followed. We both dressed casually in blue jeans and t-shirts. I had a blue jean shirt on but left it open and untucked. While getting ready for the day I called the New York Times tip line and left a message for the gossip lady. Her parents were early. We talked for a few before they left. While we were on the sofa the spread, she had on had crumbled. As a result, her parents got the idea of where I had slept. When Bridget's father saw it he smiled. Clarence suggested I change my facial appearance for a while until things settled down. From the media coverage, he believed that Dinah was going to cause ongoing problems. That's when we decided a full beard and mustache would be started. They called Bridget when they turned on my cell phone and changed the settings turning the GPS on. It wasn't 15 minutes till two cars left my place and headed out. My ex-wife was in one of them. Just in case I climbed over the backyard fence and entered my home from the rear. A quick look proved it was empty. Loading up my car with my belongings took about two hours. I left the items I knew that Dinah had bought for me behind along with all my socks and underwear. Outside of clothing the only thing I did was reset the home computer to its original factory condition. In doing that, any connection to my office was permanently gone. I took one last look around the house, as I took the house keys off of my keychain, placing them with the garage door opener on the kitchen counter. For me, it symbolized putting the past behind me, freeing me to move forward with my life. I opened the garage door and fired up the car drove next door and backed it into hers. I then closed the bay doors. We had to move a few things around in the master bedroom closet to fit my stuff in. The master bathroom had two sinks I took the side that was available. Some of the things I owned had to go especially after Bridget saw them on me. If it didn't compliment me, it wasn't good enough. That showed me a lot about our lives going forward. Bridget was the type who would always take pride in how her family looked. Her parents called Bridget at 6 and suggested we meet for dinner. We agreed. When we met them, it was apparent that they had had a day like no other. The first thing Clarence did was hand me back my cell phone. Bridget and I could tell they were in a really good mood. It was fun watching them walk into a place where we were. Heidi said, spreading themselves throughout the location looking for Trey. They must have wasted an hour at Macy's. Dinah was so well known publicly there were people taking pictures of her everywhere. People were shocked that a lady of her status would be caught in a place like that. They had all sorts of questions which only slowed down their progress. You could tell she was frustrated. Each stop they went to it got worse for them. Once they showed up, we turned the GPS off, Clarence said with a laugh. After the fourth time, we heard one of her entourage say, He's not as dumb as she has convinced herself to believe he's having us chase a ghost for some reason. That comment made both Bridget and I smile. Bridget's parents had been followed around all day. Each stop was further down the social ladder for Dinah and her entourage. It made me wonder if Dinah would clue into what was really happening. If she ever got to talk to me again, I knew that one of the excuses she would use was, I did it all for you. As we ate our dinner, we explained what had happened since Dinah got served. Bridget said to her parents, we were talking last night about our relationship going forward. Trey said, Do you think we can put the needs of the other first like they did? I said that they had been working at it for years. What you don't know mom and dad, is that we were both talking about you. Clarence got a big smile on his face. His wife got teary-eyed. I got my clothing and personal items out, and back to Bridget's house thanks to your help. 
Bridget said I had to try every piece on. I said, what your daughter thought didn't compliment me got put in a pile for goodwill. We dropped them off on the way here. Get used to it, Trey, Clarence said. I've been married to her mother for 35 years, and my wife still does it. Dad, Bridget said. He responded, what we all know it's the truth. Both her father and I started to laugh. I went to pay for the meal, and her father went to stop me. It ended up with both of us holding the ticket. So I said, let us. You have already done so much for us today, so give us a chance to show you our appreciation. Clarence, just listen to him, Heidi said. He wants to be your equal. You wanted to be treated the same way by my dad. Do you want to play the game of one-upmanship with him? Remember it took years for my dad and you to come to an understanding. Clarence smiled and so did I. We both had to admit she was right. He said, that wisdom over the years has talked me through a lot of things. Each time she does it, it's done out of love and with a knowledge that sees things from both sides. Some of my greatest accomplishments have come because I listened to her. With that said, he took his hand off the ticket. Bridget whispered, thanks, dad. Bridget's mother's face glowed in a visible blush before she said, don't worry about these two, they're going to make it. After all, he is like us made from the Missouri red clay. He will listen to reason like you always have and won't be corrupted into believing perception. Dinah Richards was exhausted. It had been a day of chasing a ghost around the city. Every time they located him, he was gone. She felt that after a few hours they would be able to sit down and talk about why he had got it all wrong. Perhaps there was a chance that she could have the operation reversed since it appeared to be the problem that had started all of this. Now all she wanted to do was go home and soak in the tub. Thankfully the event she had to attend she could sit and allow others to come to her otherwise, she would not have made it through the early part of the evening. The posts of the event and what she had found interesting had been received well. Because of the long day, she had come home early it was when her entourage dropped her off that she realized they all had been played. The bay doors of the garage were open. Trey's pride and joy was gone. He had outmaneuvered them all. It was he that had them all looking like fools. Entering the house, she found the garage door opener and the house keys when she set down her purse. Walking into the spare bedroom, she saw that most of his clothing was gone. To Dinah that was the moment she realized there was no hope. Trey had found a way to move on with his life. It was then that she realized that in the pursuit of her dream, she had slowly driven him out of her life. Dinah was sitting in the dark crying because in her own way she truly still loved Trey. In a big way, she began to realize it was who and what she associated that had pushed her directions, activities, and thoughts as she built her new persona. Dinah had never seen that in doing so she had lost sight of who and what she was. Bridget clicked the door garage door opener as I backed my car in. We had been so busy talking about the dinner we had shared with her parents that we forgot to check to see if anyone was home at my former residence. Sunday. We got up early and went out for the day. Again, it was a day of discovery that drew us closer. It was almost 10 at night by the time we got back. As soon as we were in the house, Bridget took the roast beef out and started making the sandwiches for me to take to work. What do you want on them? Bridget asked. Butter and a little bit of salt and pepper, I said. Anything else makes the bread soggy by lunchtime. I watched her make three sandwiches for me and placed them in separate Ziploc bags. Then taking a brown sandwich bag out, she wrote my name on it. Bridget saw me tear up. What's wrong? She asked. Nothing. I just see you packing my lunch for what it is, I replied. That's all. What's that my mom still does it for my dad all the time? Bridget replied. A simple act that is done out of love, I replied. Mom, after she caught me with my head on your shoulder sound asleep, warned me that you had a gentle soul. I asked her why it was a warning. She replied my grandfather was like that, and he and grandmother had ten children. I couldn't help it. I started laughing and said, those were the days before birth control, and it was the twinkle in his wife's eyes that caused it all to start. She had just finished cleaning up when her phone rang. Her dad worried about the neighbor had arranged for a limo to pick us up and drop us off at work for the next month. Talking her into my arms, I leaned down and kissed her passionately. She responded in kind. Slowly things progressed as we began moving slowly to the bedroom. It was time, and we were ready. It was a night when we both put the needs of the other first. By the time we were done discovering all we could about each other, it was almost time to get up. While showering together for the first time, as we got ready for the day the first time as a couple, I washed her body down. She went to work glowing in frustration because by the time I was done she was just as ready as I was to hop back into bed. The limo dropped me off at my firm first. I was wearing a black pinstriped suit for the first time. With my briefcase, I was carrying the bagged lunch Bridget had made for me. On the way to my office, I stopped at our luncheon room to put my bag in the fridge. 
The receptionist who was making the first pot of coffee for the day looked at me and whistled. A new suit, a new image, and a huge smile so early in the morning, she said. Who is she and how long has it been going on? I just laughed and responded. What makes you think it's that? Maybe it's just being free from the past. No, Trey. You have the look of a man who is discovering real love for the first time, she said. I'm happy for you and her. I hope she feels the same way. I was in the luncheon room eating the first of my three sandwiches at the mid-morning point when the receptionist came in saying, Are you expecting a client this morning? I said, No Mondays are usually set aside for reviewing my clients' accounts to make sure they're still heading in the right direction. Emerson Stevens here wanting to talk to you, she said. What should I tell him? Tell him where I am, I said, and find me a cup he can use. When Emerson came in, I stood up to greet him. Well, Trey, you're finally dressing for success. I like the new look, he laughed. Roast beef sandwiches that are homemade. I'm impressed. I guess you're here to talk about Dinah, I said. How are you and the better half handling it? I broke the news to her Friday afternoon right after getting a copy of your divorce papers. Did you know that my wife has a sister just as dirty and conniving as Dinah? He explained. I told her that you had warned me about what she had done to prepare me. She wants you to know that we will always consider you part of the family, Emerson explained. The New York Times has an interesting story about Dinah and her entourage running all over the city Saturday looking for something that they couldn't find. They were wondering why she was out of her normal high society spots and slumming down. Guilty as charged I needed to get my clothing out of the house, I said. By the time I got home Friday night, she and her entourage were already there. So, I had someone holding my cell phone with the GPS on figuring she knew someone who could track it. Just so you know, Dinah believes you have found someone new, Dad explained. Because you had to have helped to pull off what you did. All of your contacts that she knew said they hadn't heard from you all weekend. She blames the person who helped you for making her look like a fool. She is bound and determined that when she finds the her, her words not mine she's going to put her in the hospital. Thanks for the warning, Dad. She's right because she pushed the two of us together. They were best friends for years, I said. Both mom, and you have met her a few times. It started after I had moved to the spare bedroom because Dinah felt I needed to be watched so whatever I did or said did not interfere with her agenda. So, Dinah asked Bridget to monitor my movements and thinking while she came up with a scheme to defuse the situation she had pushed us into. He sat there looking at me for a few minutes and said with seriousness, Dora and I think the world of Bridget. Do Clarence and Grace know? They were the ones moving around the city with my cell phone. I said, over dinner. They said it was the best fun they had in years. To be honest, neither Bridget nor I were looking for a relationship but with the situation, we were both put in by Dinah caused us to be together a lot and it happened. Trey do you think it's going to get serious between the two of you? My father-in-law asked. I was on my way home on Friday to have the locks changed when Bridget informed me Dinah and her entourage were already there waiting to confront me when I got home. I ended up staying the weekend at Bridget's. Both of us can see us achieving the kind of life we want but neither has had. My father-in-law picked up his cell phone and called Clarence Smith setting up a lunch meeting and then said, I want to see if Clarence and I can get you both out of where you're living. Dinah is on the warpath. She believes it's outside interference that has caused all these problems, not her own conduct. Her aunt caused a lot of problems when her marriage broke up and ended up doing time because of her extreme actions. She, like Dinah, could not accept responsibility for her own conduct. I think some separation of space might be the best prescription for now. Dad, I read the New York Times Gossip Ladies articles on Dinah to her before I moved to the spare bedroom and said who am I to argue with the truth of the most respected liberal paper in the United States. I said, then I asked her to prove to me that she wasn't having an affair knowing damn well that she couldn't. It hit him for the first time that she by her own conduct had built a case against herself, so he said, she marketed herself into millions and out of a marriage at the same time. It's sad that she will never understand that. I was sitting in the little luncheon eating my last two roast beef sandwiches at lunchtime when the president walked in. I hear you had Emerson Stevens sitting in here with you this morning. Anything I should be concerned about? No, not really. He was just touching base, catching up on a few things before his luncheon meeting with Clarence Smith. I said as I stood up and closed the door to the room. Off the record, they have been casual acquaintances for years. Their daughters used to be best friends. And you have a personal relationship with both if my understanding is right. The president said. That explains a lot of things. Some in the business think their organizations would make a good merger. Sir, I don't get involved with their actual business operations. If they want business advice, I tell them that it's best that I stay out of it because it could cause a conflict of interest and affect my career. I said in a serious tone. 
But I have offered to put a few experts together if they needed it, because I have a few that are good clients. Trey, I think from now on you should just call me by my first name. A man who walks in the shadows of those two men is very trusted by them. He said. It also shows what they think of your character. Okay, Gordon, I can do that. I said. As soon as he left the luncheon room I knew and understood fully this game we called life. My boss, based on what his perception saw, had made a decision about me based more on what he assumed than what he knew. It showed to me just how important truth and honestly were because his perception had nothing due to with what I knew to be the truth. Bridget called me around one o'clock. Emerson and her father were gone for lunch together, and she wanted to know what was going on. The first thing I told her was how much I had enjoyed my three sandwiches then I explained what Emerson had told me. To Dinah, I've become the reason for the end to her marriage, Bridget said. Her perception has distorted the reality of it all. It's sad when one's view won't allow one to see their own part in a situation. Dinah is trying to manipulate and control others' view of things has caused herself to lose the ability to see the truth. I said, it's sad because she has proven that we as humans will only see what we want to see. The lies, truth, or facts mean nothing. It's our perception of things that guide our thinking. It's been crazy here, Bridget said. I guess we were seen when we went to Coney Island. So, everyone knew thanks to the gossip that I was dating. Then my assistant saw my face today and asked who he was, and when did you realize that you were in love? I got it too. The receptionist was making coffee when I put my lunch in the fridge. She said I looked like a man who had discovered real love for the first time. I told Dinah's father about us this morning and how we got together. He's meeting with your dad to figure out a way to get us out of being right next door to Dinah. Emerson is worried about us. Wow, there must be something else going on in his wife and his mind, Bridget said. For him to take extreme steps like this. Does he believe she's that dangerous? Not to herself, but to us maybe, I replied. Because like so many in our society truth, honesty, and the facts don't mean a thing. It's their own perception that matters. I think Emerson sees that that's what's leading his fear for our well-being. But we haven't done anything but fall in love, thanks to her own interference with our lives, Bridget stated. Can't she see that? Not in her perception, I replied. Because she has already erased it from her mind. The silence after my last remark was deafening. Bridget was realizing just how twisted Dinah was making this. I knew that Dinah believed in her own eyes that she walked on water and could do no wrong. She had no checks and balances in her life. As a result, she had lost her judgment between what was right or wrong. Finally, after a few Bridget said, Our mistake is that as a result of her conduct we fell in love. If what we see is right, what price is she going to force us to pay? I really didn't have an answer to her question, and I told Bridget so. Our conversation brought out an understanding of our current situation and how serious it was. Emerson, I believe, has a right to be worried, I said. Neither one of us has a clue to what Dinah will do. Dinah Richards was sitting across from her divorce lawyer, who was reading aloud my lawyer's petition grounds for ending the marriage as an annulment. Her lawyer needed Dinah to see how bad everything looked on paper. Dinah needed to comprehend how serious the situation was. The lawyer realized that most just quickly glanced at the divorce petition and never read it. That was why she was reading it all out to Dinah. As she read it, she kept glancing at her client to see how she was responding. She could see what Trey was saying in his divorce petition was finally registering. The look on her client's face said it all. As she listened, Dinah learned for the first time how bad it looked from a neutral point of view. What was being revealed to her as she listened intently for the first time was very damaging and detailed. After reading it all to her, the lawyer set it down on the desk. Looking right at Dinah, she said, Tell me your side of the story from the time you met until now. I am going to record it for further reference. Why should I do that? Dinah asked. Let's just stop the divorce. We can't stop the divorce. He has a dozen or so reasons for getting it granted. But if he wins an annulment against you, it will be much worse, because he will be able to take everything from you if the judge agrees, Janice Cooper stated. Our best way to save anything is to negotiate it all before we go before the judge. His lawyer is a female liberal feminist who is one of the best in the field. She was brilliant in exposing your long-term conduct as a pattern of behavior designed to defraud and avoid the truth. She uses it as a means to expose what your plan may have been all along. She will have no mercy in taking you down. For her, it's a personal case because in her eyes you represent everything she hates. Janice stated with authority. Why do you say that? I don't admit to anything except having my tubes tied, Dinah said. She sees you as a user with no moral fiber who sells her sexuality for the almighty American dollar. To her, you're just as low and despicable as those working for sex on the mean streets. 
Janice stressed with a serious voice. The fact that the New York Times' numerous news articles are used as references to validate their points makes their claims that much more credible. The reputation of the Times to most is unquestionable. Can Trey really use all the publicity I got against me to prove what he is implying? Dinah asked. Dinah, they got all the background material from the New York Times using a court order, Janice said. Even the photographs to raunchy for them to print in the newspaper. They have all the New York Times gossip reporters' personal notes that raise questions about your long-term conduct. Any judge reading the petition will give heavy weight to the New York Times for the credibility of their reporting. When presented the way his lawyer did it makes it appear much worse than what Trey's is implying, Janice said. Every piece of gossip caused by witnesses to your conduct or the statements that have been recorded about you and documented by the mass media are being used to strengthen Trey's case. Janice took out 10 8 by 4 prints of photos for Dinah to take a look at. Each one of them was a picture of her with her entourage. All were taken under nightclubs, dimmed lights, while they were on the dance floor bumping and grinding their flesh. Each one showed Dinah in some kind of physical entanglement where her exposed flesh was being fondled, sometimes by more than just one man. The looks in her eyes in the photograph left no doubt that she was apparently enjoying it. No one looking at the photos would deny that she was in a state of sensual or sexual enlightenment, prepared and eager to go further. They were touching her in ways that there was no doubt that she was aroused. The way those pictures are taken it's quite reasonable to believe that an out-and-out -out orgy was only a room or two away, Janice said, and that you're nothing but a sex-loving woman when out of the eyes of the public. When it was disclosed in court that they were taken by a New York Times staff photographer their credibility will not be questioned. The judge will accept it as the unquestionable truth of your active lifestyle. Dinah's face went white. She could not even remember who she was with at the time and who was touching her. It might have been just a momentary incident, but that is not what the images implied. If they became public, her social reputation and image could be ruined. The New York unprinted photographs made her look like she was a living sex doll being passed around. Dinah was reminded by Trey's own words. If the New York Times the most liberal paper in the country wrote about it or photographed it, it must be the truth because a newspaper with a history like theirs would have no reason to lie. Your own father gave a notarized statement about you claiming to all three of them that it was medically impossible for you to get pregnant months before you had your operation. It is also verifying what Bridget Smith's statement says. Janice pointed out. They raised the question to the court if she could not get pregnant what was the need for having your tubes tied. That's why they were able to get the medical reports. The surgeon who tied your tubes verifies it was a last-minute request by you the day before your scheduled operation and until that moment in time you could have carried full term. Those facts cannot be argued because Trey has got too much proof. Janice went on to explain. In discussing this case with Trey's lawyer, it's been hinted that they're holding something back to be used when we are all in front of the judge because it's even more devastating. When she presents things like this in court, she is going for a kill knowing that it will leave the defendant defenseless, she disclosed. By the look on your face, I must believe that you know what it is. Dinah was on the verge of crying, but she knew it would do no good. So, she said, Try to get it sealed so we can't discuss it publicly and see if we can negotiate the rest. I won't fight the divorce. We can try, but your soon-to-be ex is the driver's seat here, Janice said. You humiliated him, made him a public laughingstock, and your long-term conduct as they laid it out makes it appear that it was deliberate. If I was Trey, everything I would do going forward would be done because of the need to get some revenge because of the bathroom jokes being told about him. But he might be willing to talk to me after he has a few days to cool down after all we're still married, Dinah said. That's not the question. Ask yourself when did you stop communicating with him as an equal, Janice asked. Because that's the day your marriage ended whether or not you will admit it. From then on it was downhill all the way. He saw it happening before you did. That's why you were served as soon as you got off the plane. That question hit Dinah hard. She had never thought that we were not communicating but her lawyer's statement forced her to think back. She stopped being interested in his life when she started the journey to becoming a social media star. Gradually from there, they started drifting apart. Trey worked all day, and she partied a lot of nights at first to keep her name out there. He'd leave for work at 5 in the morning, and she had crawled into bed about 2 hours earlier. She had started this whole journey with that knowledge in the back of her head, and had promised herself it would only be 2 nights a week. The more she got into it the more she wanted it, because to her it was a drug that she started needing. Her lawyer was just stating the facts that everybody could see but she hadn't. She had been too busy chasing the dream to realize she was walking out of the marriage in her own way. Now it had turned into this nightmare. Okay then, what about it's my body and it's my right to do with it what I want? Dinah said. 
That's why Trey will be granted the annulment with no questions asked, Janice said. The judge has to rule that Trey had the right to know that you were not going to reproduce and have children before you married him. Instead, you lied to him and came up with a plan to make sure it impossible for you to reproduce. Dinah left her lawyer's office devastated. The realization that the social media hype she created for herself was in part the very thing that her husband Trey was using to take her down. She had followed the New York Times editor friend's advice on how to manipulate the masses to create an image, and it worked so well. It boiled down to a numbers game, he said. That's all. Three out of ten will not buy it, the rest will. Those who don't fall in line will be tagged as degenerates or haters. It forces their silence. History has proven time and time again that branding them that way works well. We use it all the time to increase our circulation which drives advertising revenue up. Another trick that we use quite well is by accusing naysayers of what we have already done. Because it takes eyes away from one's own conduct. Always remember that 70% of those who believe you will buy your lies is truth. Now that same illusion she had created to build her career as a social butterfly was damning her to hell. The question on her mind was will it still be worth it by the time the divorce is done? Trey was proving that he was not the doofus she had slowly convinced herself he was. By standing quietly not saying a word he allowed her own sense of freedom, she got with the lifestyle she had created to push her further than she had originally planned to go. She was now reaping the consequences of what she sowed. It was the perception of what her conduct showed to the world that could not be argued. Whether it was the truth or not was longer important. It was the perception she had created that was being seen as the raw truth. Her own conduct that created the illusion she wanted was now being used to take her down. The mass media and her followers had bought it, and now it was believed like it was the truth of a god. She did not see the other side of the reputation she was developing. Dinah had not been defeated by Trey, but by her own actions and deeds done deliberately to market the concept to the social media which created the attention she craved. Though done in innocence, it painted a perception that could not be argued against successfully. It made the truth false and the lies true. In reality, her only real sin against her husband was when she had her tubes tied. The New York Times' credibility with its readership made it impossible for her to be able to explain what she had done in a way that would be believable. As she hailed down the taxi to take her where her soon-to-ex worked, she reviewed what her lawyer had read to her and realized that he hadn't revealed the most serious thing she'd done. If Trey was really out for revenge, he would have. So why had he kept it secret is what she wanted to know. Perhaps he hadn't found out. It was about five o'clock at night when Dinah found herself standing across the street and facing the office tower Trey worked in. She was hoping that she would be able to catch him leaving the building. She wanted to see if he would be willing to go through the divorce quietly and agree to keep it out of the news. If she was to keep anything, she had worked so hard to create she had to have him to agree to secrecy. If he had what she thought he might not, but if the case was sealed by the court, he couldn't reveal it. It was about ten minutes after the hour when Dinah saw the limo pull up. She saw her former friend Bridget step out with her father and hers. Bridget was glowing, her face reflecting her enthusiasm as she walked in excitement into the building. Dinah wondered why the three of them were together. It was clear that Clarence and her father were now friends. She wondered what had brought those two very powerful men together. It took about another 20 minutes for Dinah to find out. She had watched as Bridget went in while their fathers waited while chatting and having a cigarette. Finally, Trey came out. The problem was he was not alone. He was holding Bridget's hand and she was letting him. She studied them as they came through the entrance. Bridget's face was glowing. The way the two looked at each other she knew who the other woman was that had stolen her husband. It was easy to see by the way they looked at each other that they were a couple in love. What really hurt was that it was her former best friend whom she had deliberately used in an attempt to keep control of the situation. She had pushed them together and life had thrown them all a curveball. Dinah had to admit to herself she had never expected this to happen. As she watched them from across the street a smile came across her face for a moment as she thought of the days when her playful mood came out and they would get a bit wild. He had always called it a Bridget moment because that was her name. For Dinah, it was a bitter pill to swallow because it forced her to realize just how stupid she really was. Using the tools she had been taught by the New York Times editor, she thought she would have it all. As he said, lies and truths are only tools to be used when using perception to create a collective thought. As a newbie, she had underestimated how powerful persuasion really was when creating a perception that would be accepted as the truth by most. Dinah had tears in her eyes as she watched her husband and Bridget climb into the limo. Until this moment she had never appreciated the uniqueness of Trey. All his days he had never followed the masses or went along with what the majority wanted or believed. 
He had always described himself as an outsider who walked alone. Because of what was now happening in her life, she saw for the first time how easy it was to manipulate the general population into believing what you wanted them to. All it took was repetitive actions and words until it was sucked up by the sponges who were stupid to think with the intelligence needed to clear out the bullshit they were being fed. To appreciate that fact you had to understand that most humans will spend more time on themselves in their families and trying to survive than to take the time to think about serious things. Most had not truly been taught when young how to think with an independent mind. Dinah's problem was that Trey always had. To believe something Trey had to prove it for himself. Dinah watched them drive away together her mind went back to the time she asked Bridget if she knew her boyfriend. Bridget had responded based on what I have learned about him these last few weeks, I would say definitely not. To her, that said everything because she now had to admit that Bridget was right. She had completely lost track of who and what Trey was, a man who walked tall and carried a small stick. He would bend only to a degree, but no further. When he drew a line, he kept it. Dinah had decided that if Trey knew about her secret, he would have disclosed it. So, it gave her time to make sure he never would. Medical records would show it as a birth control service, but the clinic would show what it was when she signed to have it done. Those types of forms were kept in the official records and not sent to billing. Dinah's body shook and trembled with the realization that Trey would always search for the truth because of what he was. He was independent and would be all his days. The rules of human behavior as taught by the New York Times editor did not apply to him because he had not bought into the thought of the collective. He believed in independent thought. The four of us, Clarence, Emerson, Bridget and I were heading out for dinner. As soon as we got in the limo the champagne was poured. For some reason, the two of them wanted to celebrate. Both of their wives were already headed to where we were going. There was a lot of discussion about business and what to do going further as they both wanted to focus on their families rather than money. Impressed over my suggestions over the dinner conversation, Clarence asked, Does Trey always look at things from all sides like this with forward thinking, before making a decision? Yes, he does, Dad, Bridget said in pride. After he learned of Dinah treachery and asked me for a statement, he explained right down to the littlest detail to me what he was thinking and why. It surprised me that he was so frank and honest about it. No man has ever communicated in a completely open and honest way with me. It made him completely different from any man I had known. I looked at her with a look of puzzlement because I had never seen myself as different. That night I saw that he was behaving in the same manner, you would dad. I didn't learn until later that he was raised out of state. Bridget went on to explain. That's when I started to learn that he was not the man that Dinah was leading me to believe he was. It took me a while to realize that she had been manipulating all who came into her life for a long time including me about what kind of person he is and that we had to accept her reality of him as the truth. Trey has a thinker's mind, and when he's dealing with an issue, he will openly discuss all things good and bad about it before making a decision and take into consideration your opinions. Bridget went on to say, I learned that it is his way of mentally preparing himself for anything. A few minutes later, Emerson explained, Dinah is like my wife's sister in a lot of ways. She decided that the woman who was involved with her ex-husband had to hurt just as much as she did. So, she drove over her ex-husband's legs three times before she stopped the car. That's why we have been so concerned, Trey, Dora said. She was found to have a mental health issue. The stress, the anger, and the emotions coming out caused a break. It took him three years and six operations to heal, but to this day he requires the use of a cane to walk. With our family history, until Dinah gets professional help, we can't take the chance that she will be all right going through the divorce. Bridget took my hand. There will be no driving your car for a while. I don't want to give her the chance to be near you in any way. As we ate, we discussed little things keeping it light. Dinah approached Bridget's house carrying an envelope. As started walking up the driveway a gentleman got out of a vehicle and stopped her. Ms. Richard I'm sorry to inform you that no one is allowed on the property, he said. I'm now asking you to turn around and remove yourself. I was just going to leave this letter at the door, Dinah replied. I can't allow you to do that. We have strict orders, he replied. I suggest that you either mail it or have a courier service deliver it. Can I escort you off the property? Dinah recognized the security firm. It was one that her father had used very often when needed in the past. She had been warned by her parents that they would be doing this if they did not see that she was seeing someone professionally. Dinah started crying because she knew that her parents didn't even trust her anymore. Walking home, she decided to have a courier pick it up and deliver it to Trey's office. Tonight, she would begin to pack what she could take out of the house when she had to leave. Tomorrow, she had a real estate agent that was going to show her a few places that were up for sale that might suit her tastes. 
With what was going on in her life, right now she was in no party mood. On the ride into work, Bridget and I both agreed after sleeping on it that we would accept her father's and my father's in-law offer. I went into the building carrying my briefcase and brown bag containing my three roast beef sandwiches. The day was going fine and in the afternoon. As I was headed to grab another coffee, the receptionist stopped me and handed me an envelope that had been couriered in. It was from Dinah. My first reaction was to throw it in the trash. Instead, I put on the corner of my desk and got on with my day. Bridget called a few minutes later and I told her that I had received a couriered envelope from Dinah delivered to the office. She asked what it said. I replied that I have not even opened it yet and wasn't sure that I would. Bridget got me to agree to bring it home with me so we could discuss together what we should do. It was after dinner that I opened the letter. It read, Trey, looking back after seeing Bridget and you together I realized too late that I had pushed you out of my life long before I had my tubes tied. I lost sight while chasing the dream of what was important in my life. Even my getting my tubes tied has to be tied into my chasing my dream because I really did not consider the consequences of what I was really doing. Bridget when I asked her if I knew her boyfriend said I didn't. I just now am beginning to see how true that is. In honesty you did not leave me I left you willingly because of what I did without discussing it with you. Mom and dad demanded that I seek professional help please tell them that I have set up my first appointment. I'm still not sure if I will go but I am considering it. I have a real estate lady looking for new digs for me and have begun packing to move. When I saw the two of you together as you walked together towards the limo, I realized that we never looked like the two of you do together. It's got me questioning our relationship and wondering if we were ever in love. I may never know the answer to that. I would like to have our divorce sealed so that everything is kept out of the New York Times and other media that I am beginning to hate. My lawyer said your lawyer had built such a detailed case that there are six or seven different reasons for granting the divorce. I won't be fighting it as long as you are reasonable about it. Forever yours, Dinah. Bridget looked at me before asking, Do you think she's being sincere or not? I'm not sure, I replied. She just might be living proof that you can't fix stupid. My problem is that based on the long term lies how can I not believe this is just not more of her bullshit. I can see why she needs to keep it quiet. She does not want the real reason why she got her tubes tied to come out. That little piece of information we kept out of the divorce petition as a bargaining chip if things went really bad. What could she have done that's worse than what we already know? Bridget asked. She aborted what would have been our firstborn eight weeks before at a hospital-owned clinic, I replied. My lawyer and I kept that private because I did not want her parents to know. For some reason, her body would not accept any kind of birth control, and she refused to use inserts because they always caused woman problems for her. Bridget looked at me with tears in her eyes before saying, I presume you found out when you sued for her records. Yes, I did. I decided to leave it out because I had promised to tell Emerson everything, I said. I just couldn't devastate my in-laws with that truth, so I informed them just what they needed to know. Why do you feel they need protecting? Bridget asked while wondering why I would feel needed to act this way. Emerson and Dora are old-fashioned conservative Christians who live by their beliefs, I replied. Knowing that I knew if I disclosed the whole truth, it would destroy their world and change their reality for good. I was a man who wanted children of my own who had to ask myself what I want to know if I was them. The answer I came to was no. Bridget looked at me while taking in the seriousness of what I said and knew that I felt overwhelmed. I pulled Bridget into my arms holding her tight. For some reason, she felt the need to whisper in my ear, let it go. Don't hold yourself accountable for something that was beyond your control. It surprised me to learn that she knew I did. Finally, when we parted, she said, did we ever know Dinah at all? What kind of woman would do that to her husband and parents? One who has it all and is so jealous of anyone ever getting a part of what would belong to her by birthright, her father's millions, I replied. Now you know why I am so confused as to what I should do. Then agree to keep it quiet, Bridget said. We really don't want media attention with what Dinah's father and mine are attempting to do. I looked at her and smiled. That was not on my mind, but your thinking is right. I picked up my cell phone and sent her a text message that said, I will instruct my lawyer to get it sealed. Bridget, I'm going to send this to both your father and Emerson as an email in the morning from work. I feel they have a right to know, I said. Then I will do the same to my lawyer to have it sealed. And I did. The rest of the week went by very quietly. Reports in the New York Times showed all concern that nothing had changed as per Dinah's conduct. She was still being reported on as being the social butterfly, but was more subdued. The gossip reporter suggested that she was behaving herself because of the ongoing divorce which was now sealed. The New York Times gossip lady was questioning quite publicly why I had requested that since I had been the one dumped so publicly. 
I had sent Clarence and Emerson a list of 10 names who were definitely interested in being interviewed along with what I knew about them. Emerson called me late Friday afternoon to confirm that Dinah was indeed seeing a professional. A private investigator had been following her since he received a copy of her letter to me and confirmed that she had gone for her first appointment. Saturday afternoon, a for sale sign was placed on both Bridget's and my former residence. Dinah's lawyer had provided us with written approval to sell the house. Both Bridget and I were surprised that we saw no sign of Dinah at all. Saturday night, we were awoken from the sound of a loud explosion. Both Bridget and I threw some clothes on and ran outside to discover my old home was totally in flames. We could smell natural gas in the air. One of the security guards was holding a young man in cuffs. Fire department and police are on their way, the security guard said. It looks like he hit the wrong house. Maybe, but I wouldn't be so sure, I said. Wasn't there a clinic burned down a couple of days ago? Yes, there was, the security guard said. It has been ruled as a case of arson. The only area totally destroyed was the record room and their computer system. It was run in a partnership with the hospital. Bridget looked at me in shock as I said, please make sure that a police officer talks to me as soon as possible, because if I am right there may be another fire in the next few days. Bridget looked at me with a question look, so I added, my lawyer's office. As we walked back into Bridget's home, she held my hand. Once inside she said, you don't think Dinah is behind this do you? For me, the question is that I can't say she's not, I said. So, I feel obligated to inform the police so that they can decide for themselves if they feel they need to check it out. With her big signing bonus, she could afford it. It took about an hour for the detective to knock on our door. I answered it and invited him in. He took notes as I explained why I was concerned that my ex-wife Dinah Richards was behind it. I recognize the name, but I can't picture the face, he said. Do you have a photo? Bridget asked for his cell phone number and texted him one of the images she still had of Dinah on her phone. While she was doing that, I opened up my briefcase and pulled out the record of the abortion and handed it to him. He could clearly see that the form she signed was from the clinic that had been torched was for an abortion. I told him that if my thinking was right that my lawyer's office would be the next target hit. She wanted to hide the record of the abortion for what reason, he asked with extreme interest. As he took an image of the record with his cell phone. Dinah Richards, my soon-to-be ex-wife, is Emerson Stevens' only child, I explained. If he found out what she had done because of his religious beliefs, she would lose all rights to an inheritance. Emerson is a man who believes that life begins at conception and would write his daughter out of his life. The detective got a very serious look on his face as he allowed everything to sink in. I'm grateful for the information. You're right, Dinah Richards has definitely become a person of interest. It gives me a great starting point when I begin interrogating the man we are now holding. I thank you for waiting up for me. Now I have to go wake up the detective that's investigating the clinic fire to see what he has found out so that we can compare our notes. We would never have been able to link the two together without the information you have provided. I escorted the detective to the door and after we shook hands, I locked up behind him. It was already five Sunday morning. Bridget and I crawled back into bed to wide awake to sleep, so we cuddled each other as we talked it all out. We would learn later that I was partly right and partly wrong. We must have dozed off because we were both awakened by the sounds coming from our cell phones. I answered mine and Bridget answered her. I said put your speaker on dear and we will talk to both sides of the family at once. Everyone was in a panic. It had been on the morning news. Clarence, Gracie, Dora, and Emerson wanted to first make sure that we were all right and then wanted to find out what we knew. I told them that the security team M had hired had caught the guy, but they felt that he had hit the wrong house. Other than that, we were flying blind. Dinah moved out on Thursday. She bought a 4,000-square-foot furnished apartment near the downtown and got a short closure, M said. Her movers packed her up what she wanted and moved it. They were done early Friday afternoon. Bridget and Trey pack your clothing you're moving in with us, Grace said. This getting scary. At least here we can close the gates and secure the property. Do you want Clarence and me to come and help you? No, Mom, Bridget responded. Trey and I can handle it. We will just bring what we need to get through a couple of weeks if that's okay with you. We had put this house up for sale yesterday anyway. Between the two of we filled my full size sedan up, using both the trunk and the back seat. I had to laugh because I was feeling like a vagabond. Before we left, I called the detective to let him know what I learned and suggested that the security guards had been right in their thinking that the arsonist had gotten the wrong house. I gave him Clarence's and Grace's address and informed him we were moving there for our own self-protection until the house sold. Bridget and I had discussed what our sleeping arrangement would be for the next few weeks on the way back to her parents. It was her feeling that they would give us separate bedrooms. 
We were pleased to learn that we were wrong. They already had accepted the fact that we were a couple. When looking back at the time later it would be with happy memories, because we both received a refresher course on how to make a marriage work. The little things we learned from observing Bridget's parents' interactions we brought into our relationship made ours stronger each and every day. One of the first things we worked on together was making sure that we did not assume to know the other's thinking on anything that might become important. Bridget's parents had to laugh because we were already starting to finish each other's sentences. A few minutes later, as I was still chatting with Bridget's parents, Bridget came into her father's den all excited and said, you two better come into the family room to see for yourself what just came over the news. We followed her. She used the remote to rewind the program to start what she wanted to see. I was shocked to see it was Dinah's boy toy that she went to Paris with being placed under the arrest. He was being charged with two counts of arson. He apparently had hired a man to torch the clinic and Bridget's residence. The man who was also been charged had admitted he had gotten the wrong house. Why would he want to burn down Bridget's house if it wasn't to kill the two of you? Gracie asked. And who is he? There is something you need to see, I said. I'll be right back. As I left the room, I heard Bridget said, Mom, Dad. What Trey is about to show you and explain can never go outside of this room because of the emotional pain it will cause for two of our friends. The man who got arrested today was the one that went to Paris with Dinah. I came back and handed it first to Clarence who after looking at it passed it over to his wife. My divorce lawyer discovered it when we got the medical records. We served the clinic with a court order for their records concerning my ex-wife. She had the abortion eight weeks before she had her tubes tied. I'm going to go put this into the safe, Clarence said. I'm afraid if they can link the arsons to Dinah, it is going to come out anyway. It's sad that Dora and M may never know how much you're protecting them. With that said, he went back into his den. Grace said, so that's why the divorce is sealed. Dinah wanted to make sure that her parents would never know what she had done. Does she know you have this? Don't know, but she must be really concerned about the possibility, otherwise none of this would be happening, I said. Mom, the only question is does the tomboy realize how much he has been manipulated? Considering who he is, his monthly allowance would easily have covered the cost of this, Bridget said. Dinah may be sitting pretty in the knowledge that she can't be connected to this. That woman will no longer be a problem for you too, I promise, Grace said. No one puts my family in danger. By the time I am done with her, your divorce tray will be a walk in the park. I looked over at Bridget. Her face showed some serious concern I went to speak, but she shook her head warning me off. Later as Bridget and I laid on the bed cuddling she explained. There have been a very few times I have seen my mother with that look. Each time it happened there was a threat to her sense of peace and security. She is going to do something to resolve the issue permanently. Dinah won't be touched but she will not be an ongoing problem. My mother used to be a character actress on the stage. I believe she is going to use those skills she developed back then to send a message to Dinah that she will never forget. Hopefully it will force Dinah to speed things up, I said. I'm ready for all of it to be put behind us. I was up early so I was downstairs making a pot of coffee before getting ready for the day when a strange woman came into the kitchen. I looked at her and said, Who are you and what are you doing here? The lady laughed and said, I was hoping to be out before anyone got up. So, promise me you will forget you ever saw me looking like this. It's taken me three hours to do the makeover and get dressed. Not a word will be mentioned about this, I promise Grace. Bridget explained to me that you used to be in the theater back in the day, I said. Thanks for getting my adrenaline going this morning. I won't even ask what you're up to. When I deliver the type of message like I am going to today, I make sure before I leave, they know what they see in front of them is an illusion. I will even change the sound of my voice two or three times to reinforce the seriousness of what I'm saying. That way they will be forced to take very seriously what I have to say to them. Grace said, Once I put the fear of God into them, I have never had a problem. In my whole married life, it's not failed me once. Well, I will never forget that you could be standing in the same room with me without me knowing, I said. It's a good thing I don't have a devious mind. I was in a rush for my daughter to get married because I wanted grandbabies to hold, Grace said. Now I can honestly say I'm glad she didn't. You two met when you both were not really looking and fell in love for the right reasons. That is a blessing that Clarence and I shared when we started out. You two remind both of us as us when we were younger. In a couple of weeks, we will be flying back to attend a friend's anniversary. I explained. At that time Bridget will be meeting my parents. I've told them the whole story, so they are aware of everything. Keep it quiet for now because Bridget has not learned that part. With that Grace went out the door. I took two coffees up to the bedroom so we could start getting ready for the day. It was around 11 in the morning Dinah, having just gotten up in her new condo when there was a knock at the door. 
It was an insurance representative here to inspect and photo the place because of the value she paid for the place. Dinah let her in, and the lady began taking photos of the place while she made her first coffee. Finally, the lady spoke again, but with a different voice. Mrs. Richards, who is soon to be divorced, I am not an insurance representative. I am an agent who has been given a policy that has been taken out on you, she said. You have stepped on and used one too many people to get you to the point where you are, the lady said. I have not been hired to kill, although I wish I had. The person or persons who have hired me want to make it clear, the lady said again using a different voice, that they have had enough of your bullshit. They have decided that you have to change your ways. With that said, the lady took out a vial out of her purse, opened it, and poured the contents over the wooden dining table. It started eating it. Dinah stood there in shock. Remember the next time you see me, I will not look or sound like this, the lady said. You saw the damage I was able to do your expensive table. Just remember this day because the next time I will be throwing on your face. With that said, the lady picked up the items she came in with and exited the place. By the time I got back that night, Grace had returned and looked her normal self. Bridget and I spent Saturday and Sunday house hunting. On Monday, Bridget called me around 4 o'clock and said, We're going out for dinner with Emerson and Dora. They said they need to talk to us both. I don't know what it's about, but I think something has happened. We arrived and were led to our private table by the hostess. Em and Dora were waiting for us. After greeting each other and ordering our drinks, Dinah has flown to California to look for a second residence, he said. She is feeling the heat and wants to get out of the city. We feel something has happened that has changed her views of always being a New York girl. Maybe it's the fact that her current boy toy is looking at doing some time has forced her to want to put as much distance as is possible, I said. I really have no clue as to what she up to. She's become quiet and distant, as if something has shaken her reality to the bone, Dora said. When I asked her about it, all she would say was I did it to myself. We went over to talk to her on the weekend and to see her new place, Emerson said. It's a beautiful condo, but she is going to have to replace an expensive dining room set. It appears some kind of acid has destroyed the table. I asked her about it, and she refused to explain. I just thought Grace had delivered her message in such a way it had registered better than I imagined. Dinah was making changes in her life for her own protection. Tuesday afternoon after the stock market closed my divorce lawyer called. Dinah's lawyer had sent us a revised settlement offer. Both my lawyer and I were surprised by what I was being offered. Dinah was even willing to pay my lawyer's fees. As a result, I would come out of it better than I had thought. I told her to accept it before she changed her mind. You understand if the judge approves it, you will get your annulment will be done in less than two months, she said. Do you think it was her boy toy getting arrested that forced her to make you such a good settlement offer? To be honest, I was told that someone sent her a message in a personal way, I said. After he had been arrested, perhaps it was from someone from his side of the family. I learned last night she is in California looking for a new residence because she wants to spend more time there. As I looked over at Bridget sitting beside me reading a book on the plane headed to St. Louis that Thursday morning, I thought how blessed I was for what Dinah's behavior had brought me. Both Bridget and I had left our former employers. For the next two weeks, we would be vacationing in my old stomping grounds. By the time we got back, the divorce will have been completed. Our home would have been repainted and ready for us to move in. Bridget's parents had surprised us with it two days after I gave her the ring she was now wearing on her left hand. It was on two and a half acres of land less than two miles from their house. I told Grace the reason she wanted in the neighborhood because she wanted to babysit the grandkids. She had replied you got that right so when are you going to start working on them? As we descended down into the St. Louis airport I said, we got about a 45 minute wait before we have to catch our connector flight to the Cape. From there it will be about a 45 minute drive for us to get to Marble Hill where we will be staying. I'm looking forward to seeing where you grew up, she said and to seeing some of my dad's side of the family while I am here. Do you have anything planned for us today after we get there? You find out as soon as we get off at Cape, I said with a chuckle. We got off the plane in Cape and walked across the pavement to the small terminal. I could see my parents waiting for us. As soon as we came through the sliding doors, Bridget caught on. I was a younger version of my dad. They walked towards us and he said in his deep voice, This beautiful lady must be the Bridget you told us all about. I introduced Bridget to Beth and Ben Richards, my parents. Dad said, you go pick up the luggage, I'll go get the truck. When we got to the farm, Dad and I brought the luggage in while Mom gave Bridget a quick tour of the house. Bridget fell in love with the kitchen that had an old wood stove in it. Do you still use it? Bridget asked. Every winter, Mom said. Twice a week I bake the bread and buns for the week using that stove. Cuts down the electrical and heats the house. The rest of the time I use it when doing roasts or other large cuts of meat. 
My mom was thrilled that Bridget loved to cook and got in and helped her when she started making lunch. The four of us after eating took Bridget on her first horse ride on a trail I had often rode on a kid. We cut it short not wanting to tire her out. After we had removed the saddles, we showed her how to brush down the horses. It was fun seeing her excitement and doing what we considered normal things. Bridget had a lot of questions which we all answered. Dad, as we were walking behind the ladies, said, Looks like this time you got it right. It was after dinner that Bridget, and I had to explain how we had met. My parents had lots of questions, and we explained it as well as we could. I think their full approval came when they heard about the abortion. A woman who can abort their unborn for any reason, my mom said, has shown that she could justify killing their own spouse. That's the problem in society today, there is no respect for life in any way. Bridget and I in the privacy of our bedroom discussed what our mother had said. We both came to the conclusion that my mother had been right. We both agreed that we would no longer discuss Dinah to anybody because the part was behind us forever. It's been six months since my annulment was granted. Bridget and I had a small ceremony. My parents flew out to witness the ceremony. Like my dad told everybody he had to see it to believe it. My mother-in-law is in her glory as Bridget has started to show. So now she's running around town finding the pieces to set up the best two nurseries in town. One for our place, the second for hers. To be ready for when Bridget returns to work. The New York Times in all its glory has reported in its latest gossip column that Bridget is carrying two. It must be true because we all know the New York Times, the most liberal paper in the country, does not lie. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.